Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for being here. Quite a full house this morning. We appreciate your attendance. Today is Tuesday, April 19th and this is the Placer County Board of Supervisors agenda. Sorry we're not taking you on a trip somewhere but you're here with us for the day. It's going to be a long day. A um, lot to cover. So with that we're going to start our meeting with a flag salute by Supervisor Holmes. To the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> so I apologize up front, we have had a number of changes on our agenda, and so we'll be uh, making some of those right at the start. Uh, We'll start with our consent agenda, and we are going to pull items 27A and 29A. And I wanted to make sure everybody saw that this includes supplemental agenda item 22C. Uh, with that, board members, are there any other changes or requests for any items on consent calendar? Are there any members of the public here today who wanted to discuss or pull any items, uh, uh, suggest, comment on any items on the consent calendar for the Board of Supervisors? I don't see any hands in the room. Any on Zoom? Okay, we're not seeing any. Then I would ask for a motion for the remaining items on consent calendar. I heard Supervisor Jones first. So I, will I take that as a second, Supervisor Holmes? Okay. And then with that, this is a roll call. Megan, will you call the roll? Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. So with that, we'll go to item 27A. Good morning, members of the board. Suzanne Holloway, HR manager from Human Resources. Were there, um, did you want me to respond to the question that came in, or did you want to summarize that for the record? Or was it true? Uh, sure, I, the question, yeah, you can respond to the question. Okay. Um, I know there was a question that came in from a member of the public about the ordinance that was introduced at your last meeting on March 22nd. It was regarding the classification of senior district aid. With that request came a job title change, there were class specification updates, and there was also a salary adjustment based on the current duties assigned. In that ordinance, what we had recommended was that the old salary of management salary range 432 be updated to salary range unclassified U20, because it's in the unclassified unit. And the question that came in from the public was, how is the salary savings on the fiscal impact? It was identified that there would be a salary savings of $40,000 annually for the department. How was that calculated? Because it looked like the two salaries were identical. I wanted to clarify that the salaries in the two ranges are, are different. How we normally calculate fiscal impact is we will look at the difference between the old salary and the new salary we'll calculate out that difference on an annual basis, and then we will also add any employment costs such as benefits or fees so that the department is aware of how that's gonna impact their budget. In this case, the old salary range was $43.89 per hour, topping out at $54.82 per hour. The new salary that will be going forward that was introduced and will hopefully be adopted today in unclassified U20 has a starting salary of $34.16 per hour, and it tops out at $42.66. So that's about a nine-ish dollars per hour difference in reduction. And then when we calculate that out over the course of a year with the fees, that's where we got the $40,000 in terms of the savings. So hopefully that answers the question that Thank you up. for addressing the public's concerns on that. Mm -hmm. Board members, did you have any questions on the explanation? Okay, then I'd entertain a motion to approve this. Oh. oh, yes, public. Any public members here that wanted to speak to this item? 
Anybody on Zoom? I see none. Okay, then could I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Okay, motion Wygant, second Jones. And this is a roll call or just? Just a regular. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, and any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, the next item we've pulled is item 29A, Parks and Open Space. This is an intention to set a public hearing for the Granite Bay Parks, Trails, and Open Space Assessment District, the 22-23 fiscal year assessment. Hi, Andy. Good morning. Good morning. Andy Fisher with uh, Department of Parks and Open Space. I'll give you some background on this item, uh, which is a request to approve the engineer's report and adopt a resolution of intention to hold a public hearing on May 24th of this year at 9 a.m. or soon after to continue the levy of assessment for the fiscal year 22-23 for the Granite Bay Parks, Trails, Open Space, Maintenance and Recreation Improvement District, which in shorthand we call our Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District or L&L. The Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District is one of many uh, property, annual property tax-based assessment districts that, um, that fund specific services in various communities throughout Placer County. This one was voted uh, for by the residents of Granite Bay in November of 2001, took effect in, in uh, 2002, and it um, funds specific, eight specific parks in the Granite Bay um, area as well as uh, the development and operation of 30 miles of trails and 20 miles of bikeways. Uh, in the beginning, it helped to fund the construction of those parks. Uh, those parks are now constructed, so it, it, it pays for ongoing operation and maintenance today, and a combination of maintaining trails and helping to develop the remaining trails throughout the Granite Bay area today as well. This particular assessment is different than most. Most assessment districts or community uh, service area zones a benefit. This one is part of the lighting and landscape section of the Streets and Highways Code requires its own administrative process, which requires us annually to come to the board three times. The first one in uh, February uh, appointed the engineer of record to provide the annual engineer's report. This one takes a look at the uh, engineer's report and brings it out to the public to take a look at and then sets a hearing for May 24th, which would then levy the assessment with a 3% cost of living increase for the next fiscal year. So this is the second of the three parts of that process for this year. Great. Any questions, board members? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Andy. Good morning. Thank you for that report. I'm curious. Um, can we see the engineer's report, or is it some big lengthy document? It is, and I believe it's attached either electronically or, or by copy. It's about, uh, what is it, 40 pages long? 28, 30, 32 pages long. Okay. Um, so I believe it is attached to the uh, item online, and we can get it to anybody that would like a copy. Okay, I'd like a copy. That would Very be well. great. Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you for, for taking the time to explain it to my constituents, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other questions, board members? Any public comment on this item? Yes. I have a question. Is that it? Did you skip you need, I'm sorry, sir. You do need to come to the podium. We have this. I'm sorry. Required. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Did you skip over the public content? Con, uh, no, we're things? still on consent calendar items that we are hearing that we pulled off the consent calendar. We're going to public comment pretty darn quick. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Okay, none on Zoom and none in the room. Then I'd accept a motion on this item. Second. All right. Motion Jones, second Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now is our time for public comment. Sometimes I can deliver quickly. <laughs> Uh, and these are for items um, that people would like to uh, discuss with the board that are not listed for action on today's agenda. Uh, we are going to limit our comments to three minutes per person. And again, these are items that are not on our agenda for today, and we're not allowed to take any actions or give direction on, on but we are willing to hear your concerns. Yep. So, sir, I'll ask you to go ahead and come up and... Good morning. My name is Richard. Um, <clears throat> in August, I uh, 
submitted to the board a uh, potential Second Amendment Sanctuary County resolution. And, I, and I've seen no action on that. Uh, I think it would be good uh, to bring it up for a vote. If you vote no, that's fine. I'd just like to know who's against it. So, uh, and I think with the, uh, I'm hoping with the new chair and a new sheriff, we can probably get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Nicholson. It's a pleasure to be here at the, the Board of Su uh, Supervisors of Placer County. Uh, I had a situation arrive that I've been dealing with for like six months up in uh, the uh, Hampshire Rocks area, Big Bend. Uh, some reason a, a gate appeared on a public, uh, public access adjacent to uh, Hampshire Rocks Road. It's all in Placer County. I, I researched it from the uh, Forest Service who said it was Caltrans and Caltrans said it was Placer Counties and Placer County said it was Caltrans. Finally got to Placer County and we did have the Placer County Surveyor. A uh, wonderful person, Leslie uh, was her name, uh, said, yeah, it's Placer County. This gate has uh, restricted access to one half mile adjacent to the South Fork of the Yuba River. Uh, I have been uh, dealing with hopefully to solve this problem at the lowest level. I dealt with uh, the people in the operations of uh, Public uh, Works, uh, Matt Randall, and then his boss, Ken Graham. I sent them a certified letter. Uh, I think they just throw it in the garbage. Uh, the guy has just commandeered a half mile of right of way. And I know my right of ways. I know from the Donner Lake to our Dutch Flat, the Donner Lake uh, uh, toll road to the Victory Highway to the Lincoln Highway to Caltrans 80 Cal and 40. Uh, this is a blatant uh, land grab, and it seems that Placer County doesn't want to do their job. Uh, like I said, I've emailed Mr. Leopold. I think he got it. I don't have no reason to, to do it, but basically somebody needs to do their job and tell them to get this gate out of there. It's a beautiful gate, but it's restricting access to public lands and uh, place that I go and other people go that has great fishing, swimming, uh, and uh, recreational opportunities. And uh, it wasn't even permitted gate. The original property owner where the gate is and where it rightly should be, I think, uh, had a permitted gate. This guy just went and put up gate. Beautiful wrought iron gate. It needs to come out. They keep saying they sent a letter, they did this. This has been going on since last November. And uh, that's when the surveyor said that this is Placer County right away. You know, and I'm tired of dealing with it. And unfortunately, I have resources. Or fortunately, because I got a guy, you know, they have three names in lights down in downtown Sacramento. And uh, I'm giving you two weeks, and I'm just going to sue you guys. Because somebody should get off and do something about it. The facts are the facts. And I think they just, all my communication is just like thrown in the garbage. Oh, they had a snowstorm. Well, it's the first snowstorm ever in Plaster County, I guess. Anyways, uh, I appreciate your time, but just remember, you got two weeks. And then the county council and whoever else you guys can answer my questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nicholson. We'll follow up. My office will follow up on this item because it's in my it district. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and um, recently I heard that we uh, had a motion through the state to not uh, force the COVID vaccine for schools. And about a month ago, we approved, uh, or the board approved, a package of like $3.6 million to promote vaccines for school. And it was my understanding the COVID vaccine was in that packet. And so I was hoping the board would consider going back to the people that promote the vaccines that came in and talked that day to take the COVID-19 vaccine out of that um, promotion since it's not going to be needed to go to school and my understanding was the vaccines were going towards the school um, also I'd like to bring up just a point of the delayed development of a lot of children because of COVID we had a lot of uh, lockdown effects 
um, to young children up to 18 months, which is the year and a half um, delay for a lot of our upcoming generation for um, developing brain, motor function, all the things. And I'm not sure what that's going to have effect-wise on our future and our future generation. But um, it's quite possible we could go into another lockdown. There's lockdowns going on all around the world. And our health supervisor, Dr. Odom, or whoever he is, um, has recently supported to um, defund the sheriff's department um, through that mandate um, he supports. So Placer County can't choose to follow the mandates or not. And I don't think we're really looking at the bigger picture of what that law would do if it went into effect. Because the board here, we were fortunate enough to not follow all the mandates that the state put through and Sacramento County put through. And um, we're gonna put a lot of pressure on our sheriff's department if they have to follow mandates um, you won't have a choice to not follow a mandate if you find it unjust. And most of the mandates don't really follow through with our California Constitution as well. Um, so I would really like you also to consider who you guys have put in charge of our health and safety because I don't feel as though that they're actually doing health and safety for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi. Hi. I'm Don I have packets to pass out. I'm Donna Delno. I'm a Penryn homeowner for 22 years and I love the town of Penryn. I was the lead fundraiser for 5 years and volunteered a group of people that raised 112,000 for the Penryn playground that's out there. It was put in in 2011 because it's all about the kids. So now there's kind of rumor going around that there's a possibility that might close the Penryn library. So I, there's some groups maybe working on it, but I jumped in with my social media to put a little bit of a survey on my Penryn Facebook page. I have 2,500 followers, and with just in an hour, I got 71 comments, and I copied them. They're in your packets of all the people saying why we need the library open, why is it closing, why weren't we notified after the pandemic kind of let us back out to open the library again. So my thought is, Every town needs a library or close proximity of one. So for Penryn, we are a small town. We have very few places to gather. So we have the school community and the beautiful playground. And then the library, the post office, Griffith Quarry Park, Trailer Ranch. But that's pretty much it. So the library, I feel, is very important, especially for kids, to get them away from their screens, go to the library, do the summer reading program, have books. There's even aut autistic uh, children through the county that come in and sort and file books for the library so that that would be another reason to keep it open so I listed um, my nerves are taking over but I had listed I'll do a couple more points here uh, let's see here it's good for the kids to go through the library browse through their books uh, we have Wi-Fi and photocopy machines people do job searches there if they don't have internet and need to do um, some research but basically, my biggest thing is that libraries are for the education, health, and well-being of communities and help people educate themselves, both rich and poor. Um, the library's been open 99 years or 101 years. I haven't found that out yet. But if we've made it 100 years so far, we need to find a way. There's also a rumor that the rent is only $500 a month. So if that's the case, I mean, putting even a half-time employee in there and the insurance can't cost that much to keep it open. So I'm begging everybody to find a way to keep it open. We've got money for all kinds of stuff, but if this could fall under you know, infrastructure money or some other kind of money, it needs to stay open for another 100 years. And that's, that's all I got. <laughs> so thanks for considering it. Thank you, Donna. And I know we will be getting a report from a consulting team at, at our May 10th meeting okay. on, on the item that will start then public processes and public meetings, and no decisions have been made. It's okay. a report. I can also do a survey on my Facebook and yeah. put it to the Loomis community and get that for free and quickly, and we had nobody said no. So, I mean, we just right. have to, when that comes up, it, we need to really think about it. 
Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. Time. Start. Okay. Good morning, board and associates. Uh, I believe these, these comments are directed to the board members only. I believe it was in December, I gave each of you a book entitled The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates by Matthew Truhella. And I wondered if you would add opportunity to read that book. I have not. No. <laughs> Okay, some poquitos. Um, there is a principle in there called uh, the uh, principle of interposition, where uh, individuals such as yourself who are elected uh, representatives uh, interpose uh, between the higher authority and you would be considered lesser magistrates in that case. The, uh, the hope is uh, that as we have issues such as Jennifer had mentioned, uh, that we would uh, understand the situation, the current situation, and actually work through as, and you guys as lesser magistrates to protect the people, protect their rights. So bottom line, <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Yes. And and I know we know you, Skip, but can you say your name for the record? My name's Skip. Thank you. Resident of Placer County. Thank you, Skip. I appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Muriel Davis. I'm a resident, and I'm also a member of the Friends of the Penman Library, and I, w I wanted to read my statement really quick so I won't forget anything. I have an, uh, another comment and question in addition to what Donna presented. When the other libraries and the small businesses opened so that people could go inside, even then the Penman Library did not open. Placer is a rural county, as we have heard. <laughs> so why does it seem like it is ignoring the rural Penman Library that is needed by the nearby rural communities in the Loomis Basin area, including cities, uh, and including Newcastle, Ophir, Loomis, and some of the people that come here come from uh, uh, Lincoln and, and Auburn. So that is, I have that question for you, and I don't expect an answer, but I'm hoping there'll be an answer on the May 10th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, County Council members. Uh, I'm Bargo Vivek Anandan, a proud resident of Roseville, and uh, I think we enjoy living here and one of the best places we've ever been in the U.S. My family uh, and kids love it. So the infrastructure and the facilities, uh, uh, the inclusive community uh, is just unparalleled. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to represent HSS, Hindu Swam Sevak Sang, uh, and I'm a, a volunteer for HSS. Uh, and here to refute or, or uh, you know, bring to the notice uh, of an individual who has made some hateful and extremely inflammatory allegations on HSS and the Hindu community at large. The word used in relation to HSS are baseless and venomous allegations. Uh, this person is going to every city council and spreading hate against HSS and disturbing the security and harmony of the Hindu community. Uh, and, uh, and it's no surprise that he's going to come back again with uh, new lies and baseless facts. As many of you may be aware, HSS is a US-based uh, 501c3 voluntary nonprofit uh, social, educational, and cultural organization. HSS USA works only in uh, USA, and we don't have any work outside of USA. And HSS is founded on Hindu philosophy, which is essentially a, a, a way of life, right? Uh, we accept all paths, all religions, and essentially, uh, you know, say that every religion, every prophet, uh, uh, and, and the methods are, are basically a means to the same goal, which is to realize the divinity within one and all of us and all living beings. So, and it lays out a beautiful path to uh, uh, you know, self-realization and the spiritual realization through community service, and that is what HSS is founded on. Uh, and and you know, we we uh, it's HSS is all about giving back to the community, community service. We help with uh, social work, uh, uh, you know, 
and we have a community uh, weekly meeting you know out in the parks you know bring the kids together and then have have agendas where we cater to kids uh, some philosophy and some play as well so that's all we do on a weekly basis so trying to build the community uh, and and we bring the Hindu pluralistic values in making us not only good citizens but also good humans. So I think we are being misrepresented, and it's it's also a threat to our security of our community. So that, uh, which is why we wanted to you know bring this to your notice, and I appeal to all the council members to reflect upon your uh, 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 you know personal interactions with HSS and evaluate our actions based on your experience. We would uh, love to have you all in our upcoming events, celebrations, so that you can personally experience our culture. Uh, yep, uh, and uh, that, that's essentially the message I wanted to convey. Thank you. Thank God you for your yourself. comments, and thanks for clarifying the comments that were made previously. So yeah. appreciate that. Thanks for, Thank thanks you. for the time and opportunity. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public in the room who would like to address the board? Okay, anybody online that would like to address the board? Great, well that'll conclude our public comment period then. We'll move on to board member and county executive reports. Are there any board member reports? Not seeing any, so. Uh, I have a short oh, one, I have yeah, a short sure. one. Great. Um, I was invited again to the Eagle Scout um, forum Great. and presented some certificates on behalf of the Board of Supervisors to those Eagle Scouts. It's always such an amazing event and to see these young people and the accomplishments they've made. Thanks, thanks for doing that, great. Yes, Todd. Uh, yes, Bryce, we have a, a couple items. One, I just <laughs> want to give you a quick update. Was able to go out to the Rotary Club, uh, the Gold Country one last week. That was actually, that was a lot of fun. We were able to kind of talk about what's going on in the county and I think they were surprised if anything about all the activity here so i think it's always good to get out there uh, also was out last night with the auburn navy league and they were uh, just a great group of people as well so able to share kind of what's going on i think that's uh, always a good thing um the last one i wanted to speak to is uh, joel um is here uh, i want to give you a quick update on sb 1464 what we're doing what this bill is kind of the status i think it's continually evolving as we talked about even yesterday. So, Joel, I'll turn over to you and kind of what we've been doing on an advocacy standpoint from that. Uh, good morning, members of your board. Joel Joyce of the County Executive Office. I know many of you have received uh, numerous comments, emails, phone calls, et cetera, and uh, members of the public have spoken uh, to this bill here today. Um, an update on SB 1464 authored by Senator Pan. So, in summary, uh, this bill would require local law enforcement agencies, police departments, our, our own sheriff's office. Um, current law states that local law enforcement agencies may enforce local, state and local public health orders. Uh, this bill would amend that word may to shall, uh, basically requires them to enforce local, state and local public health orders within their own jurisdiction. Um, additionally, uh, the bill, which was just amended again yesterday, um, for those local law enforcement agencies that do not uh, enforce state and local public health orders or publicly oppose enforcement of those orders, the state would prohibit um, any pandemic-related funds from flowing to those local law enforcement agencies. So that was the most recent update as of yesterday. Uh, going forward, the bill is up in committee, Senate Health Committee, on Wednesday, April 20th. Um, if it is heard in that committee, which I will say that it's, the bill has been pulled twice from that committee, over the past six weeks. So it's um, still dubious whether that bill is actually going to be heard. However, um, the author of the bill is the chair of the Senate Health Committee. So if it does get heard, um, it's pretty rare that the author's own bill, that's the chair, uh, wouldn't pass. Um, if it does pass Senate Health, it will be up in Senate Public Safety on April 26th. Um, it has to pass both Senate Health and Senate Public Safety by April 29th. Uh, which is the deadline um, for bills to get out of the policy committees uh, before it heads to appropriations. One big thing, uh, this, this bill does have a long slog ahead and will continue to oppose it every step of the way. Um, I should have started out with Placer County has opposed this bill. Uh, late, late last week, the county sent an opposition letter to Senator Pan. And my, to my most recent knowledge, we are the only county in the state that has opposed this bill at this point. 
um, just for folks here aware in the public, the city of Rockland has also opposed this bill um, as, a, as a local agency, and then obviously many county sheriff's offices and um, cities around the state have opposed the bill. Um, one, one big major issue with this bill is, is it does require a local mandate. Basically, it is requiring local law enforcement officers to enforce these orders, so therefore the state would have to pay local law enforcement agencies to enforce these orders. Um, so it does have to go through the State Commission on Mandates, and thus is um, a pretty major appropriations bill, which, which is why it's, it's going to have a long slog in the legislature. So, um, you know, my best educated guess is, is to be honest, is this bill is not going not gonna to go anywhere over the next two weeks. Um, it may pass Senate Health, but I, I think it will, it will die in Senate Public Safety. Um, that's my best guess. We'll continue to oppose it and fight it, um, and we'll see what happens. So. Uh, any questions? I'm happy to answer. Board members, any questions? I don't have any question, but I just want to thank Todd for bringing it to our attention and Joe for the work that he did behind it. In my time on the board, um, I've always been a proponent of having more local control. I think the boards generally have also endorsed that. I think uh, there was an article in Sacramento Bee a few weeks ago talking about Placer County's COVID performance being good but yet our embracing of the state mandates was very low. We pushed back against those policies, so our economy survived much better. Um, long and short of all of that is there are times when we're going to agree with what happens in Sacramento, and there are times when we're going to disagree with that, but the controlling driver, I think, is to maximize local control uh, to the extent that it is at the expense of state control. So I appreciate that effort. I appreciate the fact that you gave us an opportunity to mention that. Any other comments? Any public comment on this item? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. You know, Cindy, may I make yes. a comment? And uh -huh. just sort of a follow up. Um, and thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. Um, we had a lot of folks who were concerned that our Dr. Oldham's name was on the letterhead. And I, and I want to go ahead and address that um, because there was concern. And uh, I'll share this. And that is, I know what it's like to be on a board and have a board take a position and then be on the opposing side of that issue. Um, just because you sit on a board, like we sit on a board, um, and if one of us disagrees but the majority agrees, um, that is the decision by that board. Um, I currently sit on the board of CSAC, California State Association of Counties. Recently there was an item that came before our board to advocate for or against. I was one of four people of about 50 supervisors in that room who disagreed with my colleagues. I made my points, I advocated, um, I was not on the winning end of that, that item, but that was still the decision of the board. So I share that because just because we have a member of our staff who sits on a professional board does it not necessarily mean that that person um, supports that position. Um, and when you sit on a board, you have an opportunity to advocate a different point of view and maybe make some changes um, to an item, which my understanding is that Dr. Oldham pushed back and gave input um, about this bill from his perspective. That doesn't mean that he won on that vote. Um, and I understand that they didn't actually vote on that item, if I'm clear. Um, they didn't, the board did not vote on that. So I share that because we've got a health officer who has worked very hard to um, balance uh, the work that he is trying to do to make sure that we are able to, as a county, uh, navigate um, these challenging issues of COVID and mandates, et cetera. Um, and I think that Dr. Oldham um, has been doing a very good job. Um, and I just wanted to share that um, just because your name is on a letterhead doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with an item. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. I appreciate that clarification. Well done. Any other comments? Okay. Todd, any other reports? Um, no, okay. No further. okay. Then we'll move on to our 920 timed item. This is item number one on our agenda, parks and open space. Um, and this is the annexation of Brockwood Estate subdivision into the boundaries of county service area number 28. Zone of Benefit 169, Dry Creek Park. We're going to conduct a public hearing and consider any protests to this action. So. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Ted Rowe with the uh, Parks and Open Space Department. And I'm here to present the uh, 
the annexation of the Brookwood subdivision into zone of benefit 169 considering there are no protests to this action. The Brookwood subdivision, which is south of PFE Road, about three quarters of a mile east of Willerga, will add an additional 17 parcels to this zone of benefit, and it will decrease the existing annual assessment by $22.01. The current assessment is $678.90, and there have been two previous annexations during the 2020-2021 fiscal year, the Winding Creek subdivision adding 19 parcels and Morgan Knowles subdivision, which added 58. The total savings by these three annexations will bring the current assessment down from $678.90 to $636.63, a savings of $42.27 annually per parcel. And two additional annexations are on the horizon that will continue lowering the assessment by adding additional parcels to the zone of benefit. And you'll be hearing those in May and June, respectively. This, what does this zone of benefit pay for? So this zone of benefit pays for the maintenance funding for the Dry Creek Park area, which includes the Dry Creek Community Park on the east side of Willerga and Doyle Ranch on the west side. While Dry Creek Community Park is south of the creek, Doyle Ranch is on the north side nestled in the, Dry creek, in the uh, Doyle Ranch uh, subdivision. The Dry Creek Community Park provides playing fields for soccer, lacrosse, baseball, includes basketball and tennis courts. And both parks provide picnic areas, bathrooms, a large play structure with slides and swings. And the two parks have also recently had some upgrades, including shade structures over the play equipment, new artificial turf fall protection under the play equipment at Dry Creek Park, and four multi-stage exercise equipment stations <coughs> adjacent to the paved multi-use trail. These four stations are located between Doyle Ranch Park in the west and Cook Riolo to the east. And the Class 1 paved multi-use trail extends from Watt Avenue, thanks to the Riolo Vineyard projects, all the way to Cook Riolo Road along the south side of Dry Creek Corridor, with additional paved trail mileage north of the corridor, which will eventually connect to the Placer Vineyards community under construction. The recent completion of the Willerga Bridge provides, also provides bicycle and pedestrian access to the paved trail system and now routes users under the bridge, providing a much safer solution to crossing Willerga Road. This uh, Brookwood subdivision will add to the multi-use trail mileage with trails along the property frontage on PFE Road, and these trails will connect recreation users to the trail network at both parks via PFE and Willerga Road. Um, the phase three project for Dry Creek Community Park will also add playing fields and other recreation amenities in the near future. So if pr approved today, the addition of this project in the County Service Area 28 Zone of Benefit 169 will contribute to maintain these existing and future recreation amenities for all to enjoy. Thank you. If you have any questions about this annexation, I'd be Thanks, happy to Thanks, Ted. Any questions? Not seeing any from the board, and so we'll open the public hearing. And uh, have we received any protests, or have the public, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item? Okay, and have we received any protests? No protests have been received on this item. Okay, so then we can adopt a resolution annexing uh, the Brockwood Estate subdivision into County Service Number 28. I will move approval, and it's always nice when we can reduce some of those fees as we bring in other properties. Second. Okay. Second. He beat you to it, Jim. So we have a motion, Gore. Second, Wygant. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank you very much, Great. Ted. Thank you for your time today. I don't know if, Steve, you need to stay around, but we should have introduced our new director of Parks and Open Spaces in the audience today. So, Steve, welcome, and we'll expect you up here soon. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Okay, we'll move on to item number two on our agenda. This is our Community Development Resource Agency um, Morgan Place Subdivision, inclusion into County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 165. Hi, good Hi. morning. Michelle good Kingsbury morning. with the Community Development Resource Agency. Um, the item before you today, as you mentioned, was consideration of another annexation into our County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 165, which supports the Dry Creek Fire Station, I believe it's Station 100. 
Um, and this is for the Morgan Place subdivision, which is about a 79 lot subdivision in the Dry Creek Community Plan area um, near the intersection of Warlegra and PFE Road. Um, this project's been around for a while and as part of, um, we're hoping to bring forward their final map, I believe, uh, by June. And this is part of uh, what we require of any projects located in the Dry Creek um, uh, Zone of Benefit 165 areas for them to annex in and start paying their assessment to support the fire and emergency services in that area. I think that's a brief presentation, but with that, happy to answer any questions you might right. have. Thanks, Michelle. Any questions, board members? Okay, any public comment on this item? Oh, it is a public hearing, so we're opening our public hearing. Are there any public comments on this? Okay, and we'll close the public hearing. Clerk, have we, Megan, have we received any? We did. We received one, one ballot, and it's in favor. In favor. Thank you very much. So with that, we can adopt a resolution confir confirming the inclusion of the property and imposing the annual assessment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Why can't? Second. And Gore, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very thank much, you. Michelle. So we're going to skip now to item 15A because we've had a request to get this item complete by 10 a.m. And so I will uh, move to item 15A. This is a public works item. Uh, to increase traffic enforcement on county maintained roadways. And Richard is here to present. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Richard Moorhead with Public Works. There are two actions being requested today. The first is to authorize the county executive officer to execute a contract with the uh, Auburn and Truckee divisions of the CHP for increased, increased traffic enforcement on county maintained roadways for an amount not to exceed 190,000 with county council and risk management approval. The second item is to authorize the county executive officer to negotiate and execute a contract with the Gold Run office or division of the CHP uh, for increased traffic enforcement on county maintained roadways with an amount not to exceed $10,000. Again, county council and risk management approval. But the Department of Public Works and the CHP are responsible for the traffic safety on our, our roadways. And I think the, the board is well aware that the, probably the number one complaint we get is speed on our roadways. We do have three kind of tools in our toolbox. It's the three E's for, for um, affecting the way people drive on our roadways. The first is the engineering portion. We bring to your board frequently radar enforceable roadways, which allow the CHP to go out there and then use radar to enforce those speeds on the roadway. Another item that we have is our traffic management plan. That's the traffic calming plan. And we've, we've used that effectively in some areas. Um, you know, there may be things, say radar feedback signs that show speeds. Probably the most effective and largest plan that went forward was in Folsom Lake Estates. Lots of traffic calming put in there, lots of speed uh, humps in that area, and, and it was very effective. Um, there's also the education portion, and we educate the public as often as we can. We talk to them on one-on-one, -on -one. we're at public meetings, the CHP is at our MAC meetings, and you know, we enforce or educate the public as often as we possibly can on what we can and can't do, because there's a little bit of misperception on, on, I think, what we have the authority to do. Um, and the third portion of that is the enforcement. And the enforcement is under the CHP for our county maintained roadways. They do patrol and site on our roadways. They have a very large geographical region in the county. They, and we have over 1,000 miles of county maintained road. And then they have the Interstate 80 as well as all the state highway systems. So we reached out to them to see if there was an option to contract with the CHP for increased enforcement with off-duty officers. And it's clear, I want to be clear here, that this doesn't affect our level of service we're getting today. This would be above and beyond that if the board were to authorize uh, this to move forward. Um, the, the way it would work, and you've probably seen it when you're driving down highways and things, there's uh, CHP that'll sit in construction zones. Those are off-duty officers that are being contracted with, so it doesn't take away from the service of the officers that are on duty. Similarly, we would contract with the CHP for off-duty officers. We would meet with them on a regular basis and identify locations where we wanted really targeted enforcement. And we would be able to get those officers out on those roadways. And you know, thinking of some of the bigger ones, Baseline Road, Auburn Folsom, certainly we have the Kings Beach area in Tahoe and, and uh, some other areas that, that we'd want to target. So we'd meet with them on a regular basis, identify what roadways we would want to have that additional enforcement on, and then they would post that and off-duty officers would then be contracted to, to work those areas. 
it would be a great tool for us in our toolbox, probably the most effective. I think the way you get people's attention is to cite them, right? If you hit someone in the pocketbook, it certainly works. Um, and it would be great for us just to be able to talk when we are talking with the public to give them an idea of within a couple of weeks we can have targeted enforcement on your roadway. So it would be a great tool for us to be able to work with the CHP and get this increased enforcement on our county maintained roadways. And if, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. And uh, sorry, Officer Martinez and uh, Sergeant Robinson are here as well from the CHP if you have any questions specific for them. Okay, thank you, Richard. Before you leave, do you, would you like to speak before or do you want? Go ahead and ask your question, Supervisor Holmes, and then we'll come back. Oh, thank you, Chair. Thanks uh, for bringing this forward, Richard. And thank you for the Highway Patrol being here. We appreciate that. So um, if someone complains to my office about speeding on a particular road, do I contact you or do I contact the Highway Patrol? It would be contacting us, and then we would work directly with, okay. with the Highway Patrol and meet them with them on a frequent basis, absolutely. So we would be the conduit for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Wygant? Yeah, so Jim asked my question, but <clears throat> with that, I'll make a couple of comments. I just want to thank Todd and Ken and Rich for bringing this forward. Um, <clears throat> my district still has a significant amount of agricultural activity in it in the lower elevation part of the county. When I was young, uh, it was common to see people herding their cattle herds down the road to other pastures, and that's rare, but we still have big rice uh, trucks and vehicles and other agricultural things that are causing conflicts with our increased population. So I'm really looking forward to the outcome uh, from all of this because as we've grown, we have fortunately embraced our continued agricultural and open space components in the county and finding some better compatibility and safety with all of that I think is key for, for all of us. So thanks. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. And on the flip side of that, in areas where we've had uh, more suburban growth, um, on the west side of the county, uh, we have folks coming up from Sacramento County. Um, we were just talking about PFE and Willerga Roads. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of speeders um, and residents who contact us with concerns about, um, about traffic violations. And so being able to have the CHP, having more CHP officers in different areas would be very helpful. Um, and, and if we move forward, Rich, what I, I think would be really helpful is to, to let us know when areas, when you might be doing some more enforcement of areas. Because I think then we can sort of let our residents know it's happening. Um, one, they're, they're forewarned. Um, but second, then they're aware that we're actually taking some actions to address the concerns that people have. Um, and that is that, you know, traffic and people speeding um, is a continued concern that our residents have. So it might be nice to be able to share with folks what we're going to do. We, we can certainly at least do that. The, and first, the first time around, not every time, but at least, and, you know, at least people are aware that, wow, there are now eyes on in this area. Occasionally the people complaining are the one that gets cited, by the way. So just, you want know. to give them a little warning? Certainly, before, I bet they've noticed that. <laughs> That's happened. Thank you. Supervisor Jones. Yes, I, I just want to say to the CHP, thank you. They've been very responsive to Granite Bay. We're in the middle of Granite Bay as the high school, which um, every morning and every afternoon is quite the madhouse. And you guys have been very active over there with enforcement um, on our student drivers who are pretty crazy. <laughs> and so, and not to mention the rest of our unincorporated areas. But I want to thank you all, and, and I think this is great. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, and I would just echo, um, I like Supervisor Gore's suggestion of where you can let us know so we can show people where their dollars are going, because we're augmenting uh, this budget to do that and, and in service to them. And what I found, Supervisor Jones, what I found um, just uh, in my area, that often it's the parents that are running late to drop off their kids that are doing the speeding, not necessarily the students, just just for information. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Is there any public comment on this item? And would you like to address the board? I would love to recognize you. You've come here the, today, and uh, we appreciate the partnership. This is a great opportunity for our residents. So. Sure. Good morning, board members. David Martinez from the California High Patrol. Um, just as I had mentioned, to piggyback on that, I think there is a, a big need for enforcement in the unincorporated areas. 
um, especially during the commute times, uh, usually when there's a big accident, it takes a lot of people off the unincorporated areas and puts them on the freeway where the big accidents are. So with an increased enforcement with additional officers, we can target both at the same time because those are the problems in the unincorporated areas is during the commute times in the morning, in the afternoon, and that basically would help. Obviously, our, our end result is to reduce collisions uh, across the board. Um, that's the reason for the speeding, for running the stop signs in the unincorporated areas. Um, and that, but that's our goal. Our end result is to reduce the collisions. That's, that's what this is all about, I think. So thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Sergeant Brad Robinson. Um, and also just to add to that, I know you had mentioned um, letting the public know where the resources are going. Mm -hmm. We would assign it like a special code. So I would be able to pull all the stats that each officer does each and every day, how many sites they write, how many verbals they give, how many motor service they help out, accidents and stuff like that. So we could present that on a monthly basis as well. Great. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Or maybe not monthly, quarterly, because y'all are busy. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to overdo, but we also, it's great if they can give it to Richard, though, and then yeah. we, then he can distribute it to us so we, we meeting, have that information. And meeting um, on a monthly basis or quarterly basis and saying, hey, we need to focus yeah. more on Granite Bay or Meadow Vista or North right. or Royal Lincoln, stuff yep. like that. Great. Yeah. Well, really appreciate the partnership and, of course, the service you provide every day without this augmentation, but certainly being open to this augmentation, especially when your staffing is so low. I've heard that recruitments everywhere across uh, our state are low, but. Well, as you know, Placer County is growing rapidly, yeah. so we have to use our resources wisely. So. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, without any other public comment, I'd entertain a motion. Got a motion from Holmes and second Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. So we're gonna jump back then uh, to item number three on our agenda. This is um, the 2022 annual adjustment of impact fees. And boy, we have quite a few fees here, so. I'm not going to try to interpret all of this, but Gina is here to run through this with us. Yes. And for the board's information, we will be taking individual motions uh, when it becomes the appropriate time. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get through these fee approvals. It is. Yep. All right. Good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board. I'm Gina Olivares, management analyst here with the CEO's office. Um, the item before you today is the 2022 annual adjustment of impact fees. And the action requested is to conduct a public hearing and adopt eight resolutions for nine fees. These uh, programs include the countywide traffic fee, the Riolo Vineyard Specific Plan fee, the Parks and Recreational Facilities Impact fee, the Parks and Recreational Facilities Quimby fee, the Affordable Housing fee, the Employee Accommodation fee, <laughs> the Placer County Fire Facilities Impact fee, the Placer County Conservation Plan fees, and the Placer Vineyard specific plan fee. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> of note, uh, the affordable housing fee and the employee accommodation fee are together on one resolution, which is a correction to the action requested, which appears on the published agenda. Uh, impact fees are paid by new development to provide funding for public infrastructure and facilities required to serve that new development. Placer County Code requires these fees to be adjusted annually to keep pace with inflation. So. Of note, this year inflation is significantly higher than in the past. Rates rose between 3.3, I'm sorry, 3.43% to 15.58%. And as such, we've reached out to our internal and external stakeholders um, in advance of today's meeting. Many uh, were aware of the upcoming price increases and appreciated the additional communication. Each fee is adjusted based on specific index uh, indexes identified in the adopted fee ordinance for each fee and detailed in this staff report. The new fee amounts will be effective July 1st, 2022. <coughs> so, as mentioned earlier, and to reference the recommended action on the slide before you today, the action requested is to adopt the following eight resolutions for the countywide traffic fee, real of vineyard specific plan fee, Parks and Recreational Facilities Impact Fee, Parks and Recreational Facilities Quimby Fee, <laughs> Affordable Housing Fee and Employee Accommodation Fee, Placer County Fire Facilities Impact Fee, 
Placer County Conservation Plan fees, and Placer Vineyards specific plan fee. So that's my presentation. Thank you for your time. And should there be any questions, myself as well as staff present and on Zoom are available to respond. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate that. Are there any questions, board members? It's a relatively routine item, but we thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. And we're opening a public hearing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bonnie. Well, um, I really appreciate this. Thank you. And, you know, um, as I read through it, I understand that we have inflation, and a lot of these fees have gone up more than they typically would. Um, so I'm, of course, supportive of it because we actually have to meet um, the cost of doing the service. Um, but I do think that, you know, we got a letter from the BIA saying, boy, would you next year, if if inflation rates are as high um, next year, we need to have some further conversations about how we move forward, right? Um, because we have housing needs, of course, um, but we're going to have to maybe find a balance this next year if, if inflation continues. So I, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Thanks for the comments. Okay, so we'll open the public hearing and uh, take any public comment on this item. Not seeing any. Uh, so as we mentioned, there's going to be eight separate motions. Um, who would like to start with our countywide traffic fee? I'm happy to. Uh, move that we approve the countywide traffic fee. Second. Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the Riola Vineyard specific plan fee. Move approval staff recommendation for inflationary adjustment to that. Second. Wygant and Holmes again. All those in favor? <coughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then we'll move on to the Parks and Recreation Facilities impact fee. Move approval. Second. Again, Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then the Parks and Recreation Facilities Quimbiac fees. Move approval. Wygant and Holmes again. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And now we'll combine uh, affordable housing fee and employee accommodation fee. This was the change with one resolution for both. So moved. Second. Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the Placer County Fire Facilities impact fee. Oh, wow, okay. Who would, I am awake. I don't know sometimes Just about. Relax. Yeah. Okay, Supervisor Holmes made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then the Placer County Conservation Plan fees. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then finally, our Placer Vineyard specific plan fee. Wygant and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, I think we got through them all, Gina. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully having inflation be less next year <laughs> on those. Okay, we'll move on to our 935 uh, item. And again, Gina, you're up. Sorry, that's why you were standing there. You knew. <laughs> this is item 4A on our agenda. So good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board, Gina Olivares again, from uh, your CEO's office. So the item before you is to request uh, a continuance on the annual price index adjustment for the Agricultural Commissioner, Sealer of Weights and Measures, commu uh, Community Development Resource Agency, and Health and Human Services fees for fiscal year 22-23. So staff needed some additional time to further evaluate the data. Um, should this continuance be granted, the item will return to your board on May 24th at a time certain. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm available should you have any questions. Are there any questions? Great. Then we'll bring this back on May 24th, and Megan will give us a time certain for that. 9.40 a.m. 
9.40 a.m. on May 24th. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I have Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. And Jones is absent. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to 945 timed item. This is Treasurer Tax Collector, and this is financing for the construction of our Health and Human Services Center. And welcome, Tristan. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the board. I am Tristan Butcher from the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office. Uh, with me today, I have Janine Windeshausen, Treasurer Tax Collector. I also have Jonathan Schmidt, Treasury Tax Manager. And on Zoom, I have uh, Chris Lynch, Bond Counsel from Jones Hall. And I also have Sarah Brown from Stiefel, Nicholas & Company. She's the underwriter on this transaction. Uh, the action requested today is to hear a presentation on the proposed financing of the Placer County Health and Human Services Center. Uh, we're also uh, asking to hold a public hearing to allow interested persons the opportunity to speak uh, on the matter of the financing of the Health and Human Services Center and then also ask for your board's approval to adopt a resolution making findings and approving documents and actions relating to the financing of the acquisition and construction of the Placer County Health and Human, Human Services Center, including the issuance of bonds, the sale uh, of bonds to Stiefel, Nicholas and Company, the underwriter, and approving the appointment of bond council, municipal advisor, and the trustee. A little background on the project. Uh, this was presented to your board and approved by your board back on May 11th, 2021 uh, for the construction contract to uh, Turner Construction Company in an amount of uh, a little less than $80 million. A CEO has discussed the financing plans back on the November 16th budget workshop and then again on the uh, February 22nd mid-year budget update. Uh, since early 2022, a group has met, including the CEO's office, the auditor, the treasurer, county council, facilities management, uh, the bond disclosure council, the uh, municipal advisor, and uh, the underwriter with Stiefel. Uh, we've met regularly, weekly, to contribute to this financing. Um, and it really goes to show how involved this financing is and how this group has come together and really worked really well together. So I really do want to thank all those members for their time because it was a very time consuming process and we, uh, we worked together through everything and uh, uh, made great use of that time by putting together a, a very good uh, financing package. Uh, total project cost is uh, a little over 92 million and that includes site improvements to the DeWitt Center. Um, upgrades to the sewer system and uh, additional upgrades. Uh, the county, uh, these are the estimates, uh, has contributed or has, um, is approximately going to fund 14 million of this in capital facilities improvement fees. And there's a typo there, it should be 6.4 million of the 2020 tobacco bond proceeds uh, that's remaining. And then uh, looking to finance upon your approval, 72.5 million from lease revenue bonds. Lease revenue bonds, uh, we'd be entering into an agreement with the North Lake Tahoe Public Financing Authority, and it's a JPA between the county and the North Lake Tahoe Public uh, Utility District. This district, or this uh, JPA was created back in 1993. Um, for assisting in financing and refinancing public improvements, something that we've worked together on uh, over the course of just under 30 years. Um, the proposed resolution provides for approval and execution of financing documents. There's many documents that go along with these lease revenue bonds. Um, number one, it'd be the uh, site lease, which is from the county to the authority. Uh, in that site lease, we would be leasing the Cedra building, the Fab building, the uh, Larry Auto building, and the Atherton building. That would make up about $73 million in uh, assets that we would be leasing to the authority. Uh, we would also be executing a lease agreement that the county will make semi-annual lease payments to the authority uh, as a sublease to the property. So we would be making those lease payments to the authority 
The authority would be assigning those payments through an assignment agreement to the trustee. So that's what would actually be paying those bonds back is through the trustee. Uh, the indenture of trust would also be executed and that is between the authority and the trustee and it provides for the issuance of bonds and instructs the trustee to use the lease payments to pay the debt service on the bonds. The bond purchase agreement is uh, authorizing the sale of bonds and it will give the authority the funds for a one-time lease payment for the site lease of $72.5 million. So it's a big circle that you're working your way all the way back to for the uh, funds to complete the construction of the uh, project. We'll be issuing a, upon your approval, we'll be issuing a preliminary official statement. This will be distributed to potential investors. This is included in your packet today. Uh, this preliminary official statement is subject to federal securities laws, the Securities Act, of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And this requires that the POS to include all facts material to a bond investor. And what's important there is what is material to a bond investor. And I'm gonna read this verbatim because it's very important. Material information is information where there is a substantial likelihood it would have actual significance in the deliberations of reasonable investor when deciding whether to buy, sell, or hold bonds. So this is really important that the information that we're putting out to bondholders is accurate, correct, uh, and in that preliminary official statement, it's a very thick statement. CEO's office worked with us on it and all of the other departments worked with us on it uh, to make sure that everything that's included in there summarizes Placer County, summarizes the different policies of Placer County, uh, to make sure that we're giving all that information to an investor. Uh, we're also in this, uh, it includes continuing disclosure certificate, which requires going uh, ongoing disclosure for annual disclosure requirements and material events. This is something that the treasurer's office already does um, on a routine basis with other financings, uh, and it's in accordance with the county's debt and disclosure policy. So we'll just continue moving on up, um, as long as we have your approval. Summary of the resolution, uh, approves the bonds in the maximum principal amount of $72.5 million, finds the issuance of the bonds result in significant public benefit, approves the related financing documents in substantially final form, authorizes the county executive officer, the treasurer tax collector as authorized officers to make any necessary changes and to execute the agreements, approves a negotiated uh, sale of bonds to the underwriter at a true interest cost not to exceed 4% and un an underwriter's discount not to exceed 0.5%. Uh, summary of the resolution, agrees to undertake the continuing disclosure obligations that were already mentioned, that the board approves the uh, preliminary offering statement, Authorizes changes to be made by authorized officers as necessary to de deem or necessary that they deem the preliminary <coughs> official statement to be final and approves the distribution by the underwriter. Appoints Jones Hall as disclosure counsel, Del Rio Advisors LLC as municipal advisor, and the Bank of New York Mellon as trust company as the trustee. Directs and authorizes the chair of the board, the county executive officer the treasurer tax collector and the clerk of the board and all other officers of the county to take the necessary actions to issue the bonds. The good faith disclosure describes that our uh, estimated principal amount of the bonds is 67,625,000. Uh, 4% is estimated to be the true interest cost. 537,875 is the estimated sum of all the fees and charges. 72.5 million is the estimated bond proceeds net of all the financing charges. And uh, the total cost for the repayment uh, over the life of the bonds is 127,135,925. That's the estimated cost. Fiscal impact, uh, 3.93 million estimated annual debt service uh, from the county general fund for 30 years. County will pay that approximate $127,135,000 over the course of 30 years. 
1.81 million annual reimbursed from state and federal agencies uh, for the depreciation of the Health and Human Services Center over 50 years. So the county will recoup that 90 million 500,000 over 50 years. The net cost to the county after uh, the depreciation and the debt service, we're looking at 36 million, a little over 36 million. I'm gonna open it up for any questions. <laughs> Great presentation, Tristan. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions, board members? The only question I would have is on the estimates for what the state is gonna pay us. You guys have a crystal ball there, huh? No, <laughs> that's the annual depreciation and it is subject to a market cap. Okay. Um, so there could be a limit on that, um, but that's, that's what the depreciation works out to. So that's the, a here. schedule that we are pretty confident on that they uh, will find. I would refer that to Mr. Chatney or Mr. Leopold. Yeah, th these are subvention dollars. These are money that the federal government will pay back for this. We feel fairly confident. It really comes down to, and I think Tristan said it best, there is a cap on administrative repayment that can be had, but I think we feel pretty confident on this amount. We're actually receiving dollars right now on some of our buildings that they're located in. So quite frankly, we'll be uh, just getting uh, dollars here back from the federal government when we move into this building. So it'll offset the overall debt payment. Yeah. I, well, I think it's a great plan, and obviously we're receiving them now. I just look at 50 years as a long time, so <laughs> what they will do in 50 years. Correct. Any other? Oh, yes, Bonnie, Supervisor uh, Thank Moore. you. I, yeah. I appreciate um, the presentation and, and really all the work to get to this point, because as I read through it, I was like, wow, this is um, a lot of work to get to where we need to be. Um, and I know this isn't part of the bond discussion, sure. but once the building is built, we have several buildings that we will no longer lease or operate. Uh, we're gonna consolidate uh, folks, and, and maybe Daniel knows that, or somebody on the HHS team, but you know, how much of a s annual savings are we going to have once you know, from those other outlying buildings once this building is built and maybe once this building disappears. Anybody have a sense of what that, at least for the HHS side, how much we're saving, um, which that money would really be, um, would go towards this yeah. annual Savings. payment? Nobody, uh, I'm not really sure. I would appreciate maybe getting back to me just so that we know, right? Because I think that it's a, it's a big number, but the reality is we're consolidating and those dollars will be used to help pay this off. Um, and then it's it's one less thing that the county is managing and overseeing, less fewer leases, fewer maintenance costs, et cetera. Uh, Steve's on the, on the call here. This may be a good one. I'll, I'll just share the one piece that I think is a, a big component. When we talked about buildings at the government center, one of them was an administrative building, um, just to address some of the deficiencies on our administrative building right now. Um, what we identified, the construction of this building is gonna allow us to move folks out of existing buildings. We have our Community Development Resource Agency building and all of our folks um, will either be moving from this building into that one. So we're not actually building and having to build a new administrative building based on the construction of this HHS building. Um, that estimate, a few years back was, I think, 41 some million dollars. It's probably over 50 at this point. So there is cost savings attributed to having a consolidated building and relocating those folks. But Steve may have um, some additional stuff to share. He's on? Yeah. Give him a second. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, Yes, uh, there's a number of, of factors here. Um, we're going to be moving a lot of people out of a lot of buildings, which um, have, you know, they were built in World War II and they've, they've had ongoing uh, maintenance issues. Um, there's the utility costs, of course, and then the custodial costs. Uh, so the, the square footage of the new facility is um, a, a little larger than the kind of cumulative uh, square footage of where everyone is now, which includes some, you know, leased facilities, um, the, the old barrack type facilities, as well as the CDRC building. So as we bring all those people into this one new building, um, we'll be able to shed, uh, you know, the ongoing costs of, of those old buildings. And the, the other, um, major aspect of this new building is that it's designed to be a net zero energy 
building, which, uh, you know, it's a it's a, a an enormous building, largest building on this campus here once it's built. Um, and to have a zero electricity bill over the course of a year um, will save us hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, I, I did do an analysis um, uh, some time ago with the, all the buildings that that uh, we have spent uh, been spending money on maintenance, etc. Um, and just in in FY sixteen seventeen, we had spent over four hundred thousand um, dollars in maintenance costs on uh, those buildings that we will no longer be using. Um, so um, obviously, the new building will have some some maintenance, um, but we'll have a you know one year warranty, and then beyond that, we'll we will um, have some maintenance, of course, custodial costs, but but the big savings I think will be the utility costs. So it it should. Be a net positive for us um, and exactly what that number will be is to be determined and and um, i will i will work on that as we have um, gathered more data to contribute to that calculation thank you steve supervisor wygant you had a comment yeah a just question? a couple of quick comments in light of the comments that have been made but <clears throat> I'm personally really excited about the work that we're going forward with. I um, want to thank you folks on the financial side as well as Steve and his department on the uh, design and construction part of it. Um, and I want to point out that particularly in the campaign year, there are times when some uh, will criticize the county for having too much money. But in fact, in the 28 years that I've been on the Board of Supervisors, this project has been on our books uh, for that full time. And we, it has taken us this much time to be able to afford uh, to finally get it in place. And it will house most of our, the biggest department in the county is the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's a state and nationally recognized model, the plaster model. And finally, we will now be able to complement the project that we have down in Rockland for HHS uh, on Sunset with our headquarters out at DeWitt. And it will add hugely to the uh, to the ambiance and prestige of the DeWitt Center as well. So I just want to point that out and make sure that the public understands that. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions from board members. Um, did, did anyone else on your team want to speak to us on this or the underwriters? OK. No, I think we're good. OK, good. Well, great job. Um, then this is a uh, public hearing. And so we'll hold open the public hearing now for any folks who would like to address us on this issue? We're not seeing any. OK, so then we uh, will do um, consider a motion to adopt a resolution making findings and approving documents and actions relating to the financing of the acquisition and construction of the Placer County Health and Human Services Center project number PJ00113, including the issuance of bonds, the sale of bonds, to stifle Nicholas and Company Incorporated, the underwriter, and approving the appointment of Bond Council Municipal Advisor and Trustee as presented. Move, move Motion Wygant, second Holmes, and this is a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Great job, team. Thank you very much. Exciting days to move forward on. Okay, uh, we're just past 1015, so we can go to our, uh, back to Cedra for our Placer County Conservation Program cost reimbursement agreement with the City of Lincoln. Item 6A on our agenda, found on page 323. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, Greg McKenzie, your Placer County Conservation Program Administrator. I will try to be brief in my presentation this morning to hopefully allow you to get some department items uh, heard here uh, after I am complete. So I have before you a request this morning to adopt a resolution approving and authorizing the Placer County Conservation Program Administrator to execute the Placer County Conservation Program Project Review and Cost Reimbursement Agreement with the City of Lincoln. Uh, so. Your board, September 2020, approved, adopted the Placer County Conservation Program, ultimately entered into a joint power uh, authority agreement with the City of Lincoln to implement the conservation objectives of the conservation program. 
What the COPE program does not do is it does not divest the county or the city of any of its uh, land use authority that is still held with county planning, building, engineering, environmental services, similar with the city. And so where PCP staff comes into play is in the project review and approval process, especially during early implementation. I think it's helpful for us to be available to the city and county both to provide uh, support, consultation on projects because they can be complex when they're dealing with state and federal environmental regulations, uh, wetland regulations, uh, especially at the federal level, which are constantly shifting, even at the state level, which are shifting. Uh, so currently, PCP staff supports county planning, building, engineering, environmental services on a day-to-day -day basis uh, where that request comes from one of those departments, we provide those services and ultimately uh, bill our time to projects as is necessary. That keeps us on par from a cost perspective with all the permittees being the county, city, Placer County Water Agency and the Transportation Agency. Um, <clears throat> And so the city of Lincoln, uh, much as we have had challenges hiring good qualified folks in the past couple of years, they have had those same challenges. They have made this request to us, the county PCP staff or county staff, to provide those same services uh, at cost to the city. And so this agreement would allow for that to occur. Um, the city approved this agreement at their March 22nd meeting and uh, request that you also adopt, approve this agreement and allow us to support them in the implementation of the Placer County Conservation Program. Uh, this project is not a project subject to CEQA as it is an agreement between the city and county. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to the board uh, for any questions. Thank you, Greg. Any questions from board members? I see none. Anyone from the audience wish to address the uh, board on this item? Anyone on Zoom? Okay, then I will entertain a motion to uh, move approval. And I'll second. It's been moved and seconded by Wygant and Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Jim. So now we'll move on to our 10, let's see, what do we have next? 1030, so we'll skip back to our department items. And we'll go to 12A. Do we have enough time for that? 12B. Hey, Tim, you've been sitting here. We'll go to 12B. This is the, sorry, Shauna. You get to wait a while. He's shorter. We think we'll get through it and start our 1030 item on time. The item um, is shorter, not necessarily the person. Oh, sorry. I mean. Oh, my. It's a tough crowd. It is a tough crowd. So this is the expedited permit process for electric vehicle charging stations. Good morning, uh, Chair Gustafson and members of your board. I'm Randall Beffert, Building Services Manager in CEDRA here to introduce an ordinance and request your board waive the oral reading to amend Placer County Code to expedite the permit process for the electrical vehicle <coughs> charging stations and propose that the ordinance is exempt from CEQA. Your board should know in 2015, the state of California adopted Assembly Bill 1236, which requires jurisdictions with a population of 200,000 or more residents to establish this expedited process. As you can see on the map, from 2014 to 2021, there has been a significant increase in, in, of installed EV charging stations of approximately 8,000%. To further facilitate the installation, of charging stations in Placer County, we've developed an expedited process to help customers, including checklists. This is a ministerial permit process that is subject to fire life safety review only. Somewhere in there. Additionally, we've discussed with TRPA and found if the proposed charging station is within the existing coverage, these are exempt from TRPA requirements. 
like many of our services we've developed, we've developed a web page where property owners and contractors can apply for these permits from the comfort of their home or office. Good news, because of our work on the website and checklist, Placer County status with the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development has been updated to in progress. As you can see in the slide, we are now yellow, which represents our in progress status. And here's a map representing the state with which jurisdictions that are streamlined in green, streamlined in progress in yellow, and not streamlined in red. Should your board adopt this ordinance, our status will be further updated to streamlined, meaning we will be in compliance with the assembly bill. Finally, there is no net county cost due to the permit fees paid for by the applicant. And with that, I'm here to answer any questions from your board. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes, Supervisor Holmes? No, I just have my... Oh, Supervisor up. Gore. Thank you. I, I do have a quick question, and that is, so the streamlined process would be not only for commercial stations, but if, you're a, if you have an ev electric vehicle in your own home, um, do residents need to get a permit, or in, unless it's like a supercharged you know, so help me out. Do you need one for commercial and residential? Yes, Supervisor Gore. Okay, so even if I were to purchase an electric vehicle and come home and want to plug it into my garage, I'd need to get a permit from a local jurisdiction to do that? Yes. I did not know that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, if I may just expand on that a little bit. Tim Wagner, your chief building official. So yes, we do want to see those electrical connections through a permit to make sure they're safe. Now, That's if right. you're charger station that when you buy your new car can just plug into an already set a circuit at your home or into an outlet at your home then you don't need a permit for that this is when you're adding circuitry because the charger requires more power than you can from a convenience of just a 120 volt standard um, or they want a fast rapid charger or to those effects and so and 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 even with that new homes today are mandated to have the capacity for the the conduit and the capacity for the breaker already pre-installed. So uh, if you're buying a new home today and you buy a new electric vehicle, the circuitry is pretty much already there for you to fit, finish up that product. So it's really for um, a home that doesn't have the capacity electric-wise, you would need to upgrade your system to accommodate the vehicle. Correct, that's part of what our checklists do is it actually walks a homeowner through what their circuitry is on their current panel at their house if they have capacity to add electric vehicle charging uh, equipment without having to upgrade their electric panel. Um, and so really we are trying to make it as simple as we possibly can. And our interests are really with the checklist or to uh, issue those permits over the counter. So uh, honestly, an owner could go buy a car today, uh, come into the Cedar this afternoon, and if everything goes well, we'd like to issue that permit for your electric vehicle to be in, uh, charger to be installed the same day. Can I ask a follow-up question? I'm just curious. So if somebody had to upgrade the electricity uh, to their home, um, then would that require an inspector to come out and verify the electricity been done correctly? Correct. So, okay. for example, many homes have 100 or 200 amp main panels in them. Some of these chargers require them to go larger than that, and so we would ask them to upgrade. So a 100 amp panel typically would have to be upgraded to a 200 amp panel, main panel, and then we, we expect to see a permit for that so we can go out and do the inspections to make sure it's safe. Great, thank you. See, I'm asking these questions so that we don't have to take another item before 1030. <laughs> <laughs> and actually very helpful. Right. No, it's very helpful, right? Because, you know, people are gonna ask questions about this and now, you know, we have a better understanding of what's needed. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay, so with that, we, I will entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Second. Okay, motion Gore, second Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I think we are one minute. If you walk slowly, you'll be here at 1030. <laughs> I guess you could have. Okay, 20 seconds left, Heather. If you're using an analog clock, it's probably all Yes. Okay. Welcome. Good morning. 
Um, hi, my name is Heather Beckman. I'm a senior planner working out of the Tahoe City office, and today I'm presenting the Alpine Meadows um, Palisades Tahoe Base to Base Gondola Conditional Use Permit Modification and Addendum to the EIS EIR. Uh, there we go. Um, so just a very quick project overview. The figure on the left shows you the alignment between the two ski resorts. It does cross both private lands and public lands that are owned by the Tahoe National Forest. Therefore, the original approval was a joint EIS EIR. The gondola itself would operate in the winter time only, could carry up to 1,400 people per hour in each direction, and has about a 16 minute ride time. So the applicant has come before us today asking for three modifications to the original permit. All of these modifications relate to the construction time frame. They're seeking a modification to two conditions of approval and one resource protection measure. A resource protection measure is the equivalent of a CEQA mitigation measure. It's just the nomenclature we had to use as part of the EIS with the Forest Service. The first modification is to condition number one. That's the project description. The original language read, the project will be constructed in one building season. The applicant did begin construction last year, but was not able to complete it, and I'll speak to that in a moment. So they came back with a modification that would delete that sentence and leave an open-ended construction time frame. During the planning commission hearing in March, the commission did have reservations about that open-ended time frame, so they worked with the applicant during the hearing to come up with the language, the project will be constructed by December 31st, 2024. The second and third modifications are shown on this slide. It's condition number 30 and resource protection measure MUL-7. Each resource protection measure was integrated into a condition of approval, so they're one and the same. The modification here is the applicant is requesting that they can um, put in requests for grading season exceptions between October 15th and May 1st, so the winter time in, in Tahoe. This is an exception that's afforded to all Tahoe projects. It's in recognition of the fact that we have a shorter building season up there due to the winter, and it's also in recognition of the fact that our winter weather is variable. So some years in April, we have tens of feet of snow. This year, we haven't had much snow since January until it turned on again this week. So it's in recognition of that variability. These greeting season exceptions are for discrete construction, construction tasks. They are rigorously reviewed and approved by Placer County ESD and the Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board and they're for one week snapshots in time. So really it's to grab that app, the applicant a week or two on the shoulder seasons. Quick project history, your board um, unanimously approved the original project back in 2019. In April of 2021, the applicant came forward with a variance to height at a couple of item, um, structures at the Alpine Meadows side, as well as there was an addendum to the EIS EIR. May 2021, construction began, um, but was not completed. And so therefore, the applicants before you today, March 10th, they went to the Planning Commission for a recommendation on these modifications. The Planning Commission did give a unanimous approval. So now a little bit about the construction status. So the applicant did work very diligently and completed a lot of work. All tree removal, vegetation removal, installation of 33 lift towers, and um, the, the initial ground disturbing activities at all the four main elements of the, the gondola. Despite that, they were not able to complete and the gondola is not operational today. Um, there were impacts related to the pandemic, so there were labor shortages, materials issues, and then the wildfires. Helicopter usage is critical for construction, backcountry construction, and so although the applicant had helicopters reserved, a number of days those helicopters were diverted to fight wildfire. They also lost working days due to air quality. So thus, they're coming back for that, um, seeking additional time to construct, but there's no changes to the operation use or function of the gondola itself. As part of this modification, staff did process an addendum to the EIS EIR. We looked at all resource areas. We identified six areas that could have possible impacts. We did a deeper dive with those. And ultimately, it was determined that there would be no new significant impacts, nor any increased impacts that were previously identified. At the Planning Commission, we did have four public comments, three in opposition, one in support. One of the main opposition comments was from Ms. Patty Schifferly. She had two points. 
Um, the first was a concern that there would be continued or almost continuous wintertime construction and that a new EIS EIR would be required. Again, we are looking at only possible grading season exceptions for one week windows at a time. She also had a concern about a private legal settlement agreement between the Granite Chief Wilderness Protection League and the applicant. Shortly after your board approved the project, the project was litigated. The applicant and the Granite Chief Wilderness Protection League negotiated a settlement for which the county was not a part of. So that settlement agreement is really not part of our calculus for this modification. A second commenter just broadly requested a new EIS EIR. And then at the hearing, Mr. Garabedian um, provided oral comment that he had concern about wildfire and egress from Olympic Valley. Again, there's no change to the operation use or function of the gondola as part of this modification, and so all wildfire and egress issues were reviewed and approved in 2019. There was one comment in support. That was from Mr. Daniel Haggerty. He's the president of the Granite Chief Wilderness Protection League, so party to that legal settlement agreement. He indicated not only that he would like to see the construction move forward, but also that he felt the settlement agreement had been adhered to. One public comment came in immediately after the Planning Commission hearing, and that was Ms. Patty Schifferly just reiterating and clarifying her opposition comments, but no um, other comments since that time. So with that, um, the Planning Commission did give a unanimous recommendation that your board adopt a resolution approving an addendum to the Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows Base to Base Gondola EIR and the Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program. And then also recommended that your board approve the conditional use permit modifications. Those are three modifications to two conditions of approval and one resource protection measure. And that is inclusive of the Planning Commission's own modification, putting a sunset clause on construction, um, noting that it would end on December 31st, 2024. I do also want to point out that there was one small typo within the staff report, and it's in the conditional use permit findings, findings 2F. Um, that finding reads, that the gondola project is consistent with section 18.20070 of the Placer County Zoning Ordinance. It should read the Environmental Review Ordinance, so I apologize for that typo. Um, but other than that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Heather. Are there any questions for Heather? Okay, would the applicant like to speak to the item? Good morning, Chair Gustafson and board members. Uh, it must be a Board of Supervisors meeting because it is snowing in Tahoe today, by the way. <laughs> Anxiously, we were seeing uh, some dirt showing itself at the beginning of last week. We've had 42 inches of snow this week, and there's about four on the ground as we're uh, driving down the hill today. So, Jason, will you give your name for the record? Oh, sorry. sorry. Jason Ansford, Altera Mountain Company. We I'm like the weather report, though, too. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Vice we President. Need moisture. Uh, Vice President of Development. I do have my uh, team here, Adrian Graham, who can enter, enter any environmental questions, as well as Casey Bland, who is our senior advisor, who's kind of managing the project. Uh, appreciate staff's uh, thorough analysis of the project. Uh, we look forward to getting under the way and completing this thing in a timely fashion so that we can be in operation this coming ski season for the 2022-2023 season, and are here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Jason. Hey, if there's no other questions from board members, then we'll open a public hearing to consider this recommendation. Are there any public comments? I'm not seeing any online either. We'll give it another couple seconds. So while we're waiting, may I ask a question? Absolutely. And that is with all this snow that we just had and some more snow um, this week, when do you actually anticipate being able to start back up, right? Because it's not till May that you're able to do so for the permit, but I'm just curious. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be very sensitive to that. We're obviously need the ground to dry out. We don't want to make a mess of things. We will implement all of our BMPs as the snow melts and make sure that we have the site protected and ready for our construction. Thanks. And yesterday so was weather last, dependent. I was going to say yesterday was the last day at Alpine Meadows, right? For operations. Darn, I missed it. But. Correct. We're uh, wrapping up this or season. Or Sunday was, I'm sorry. Alpine Meadows closed on Sunday. We had an employee day yesterday, which was well received. So that was kind of fun that we dedicated the mountain to all employees. And then at Olympic Valley side, we closed down the lower mountain on uh, the 18th. 
and anticipation of starting the construction here in the next week, two or three. Great. Okay, we'll look again and just make sure there's no public comment on this item. Well, we've assured ourselves there's no public comment. I would entertain, and we can do this in one motion to both adopt the resolution approving the addendum and uh, approve the conditional use permit modification. Okay, motion Holmes, second Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, thank you very much. You. Good luck. Hopefully, all the snow will come this week. <laughs> yeah. Okay, with that, we're going to go back to some department items. And we will go back then to item 12A, and this is uh, page 869 in our packet. It's the Allocation of American Rescue Plan Act funds for sewer improvements. Good morning. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Shauna Purvines with the Community Development Resources Agency, and the item uh, before you today is requesting your board's approval of an agreement with Halderman Homes um, authorizing the Community Development Director or designee to execute the agreements and all necessary documents for a um, uh, grant up to $500,000 of the American Resource Plan Act funds, or more commonly referred to as ARPA funding. Um, and also approve a, a budget amendment uh, to uh, uh, expenditure to, to authorize the use of those funds. So um, as you know, and as I often talk about, um, we have done numerous studies um, of our uh, employer salaries, household incomes, and just our overall household needs. And those tend to come back um, with a, a known missing middle group of housing that is um, just generally not being constructed today. Um, so the um, uh, Halderman Homes is uh, constructing two separate projects. Um, one is fully entitled, one is currently going through the review process here in the North Auburn area. Um, and it uh, would, uh, if both constructed, would create 56, 53, sorry, small um, uh, for sale units with the possibility of up to eight ADUs. Um, these units are in size from about 900 square feet to about 1,500 square feet, which tend to be naturally affordable units to that missing middle income group. Um, and um, in and of themselves, this project would be exempt from the county's affordable housing requirement um, on two, for two reasons. Um, one, it is an infill project. Um, particularly, it's an infill project in a highly commercial area, so it helps to balance the residential and the commercial uses in that area. And two, based on the size of those units, because it's meeting an objective for that missing middle. Um, however, I think we're also all aware of the impacts to the sewer up in the North Auburn area. Um, it has reached its capacity in most cases. Um, and so the project um, is been conditioned to do some sewer improvements. Um, the housing team, along with the Department of Public Works Environmental Engineering, are working on um, completing a study and some engineering plans that will help um, look at overall uh, improvements on the line, but until that time, individual projects are conditioned to do these improvements on a project by project basis. Um, for the portion of the project um, or the cost of those improvements that are above and beyond the fair share of the project, um, there is a process by which those, uh, the project or the developer can be reimbursed. Um, however, um, larger projects tend to be able to weather that a little bit better. Smaller projects or infill projects um, do struggle with uh, that uh, delay and reimbursement for those, those improvements. So with the um, uh, ARPA funding that the county has received um, that specifically targets uh, improvements on public water and sewer lines, um, we found that the funding um, did match um, and could be used uh, in support of this, this project. So uh, Halderman Homes has agreed to uh, work with the county um, to develop for 120 days uh, at what we call the exclusivity period to help market these units uh, specifically to local uh, employees um, and uh, employers who have employee needs for housing um, and also to deed restrict a minimum of four of those units 
um, for income levels of 180% for the single family detached and 150% of the area median income for the attached uh, for a duplex uh, project. So with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, or I don't see questions from others, but I had a question. So would you go over that again? How many units are deed restricted then? So the, the goal is that all of the units will be uh, based on that marketing and that exclusivity period working with the county to market, that all of the units will be deed restricted for the either 150% or 180%. Um, however, in the event that there are just not buyers after that exclusivity period is sunsetted, um, we did place a minimum of four of the units would need to be deed restricted to receive the the, uh, the grant. I um, mean, the reason that the four units was picked is that is uh, proportionate to the cost of the gap um, required to buy down those units to that affordability level. Okay, great. So there's a rationale for that. And then, you know, we can be as certain that there isn't a gift of public funds that that really is accomplishing our goal for Cor these. Correct. In addition to that, the improvements that are on the sewer line are not just limited to benefiting the project. Once those improvements are done, it actually benefits um, the, the entire North Sewer um, Auburn line, which would right. support additional development of residential and commercial. Great. Thank you, Shauna. I now see questions. Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the tremendous job you did working with Holloman and uh, Larry Farina on making this happen. Uh, that project is just the right place because it's their shopping abundance of shopping within walking distance so it's going to cut down on vehicles miles traveled and, uh, so it's uh, really amazing the type of how you were able to make this work and I, I really appreciate that thank you supervisor gore thank you shauna quick question for uh, these homes that are deed restricted. Is there an opportunity? Uh, the county has a first um, time home buyers mm -hmm. program. Um, would folks be available for that program in addition to this? And there's, a, is there a way to co market? Uh, you know, because I know up in Tahoe we had that issue of not being able to get these houses um, to that market. And I want to make sure we're able to do that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I should have mentioned that. Actually, these um, these units are uniquely qualified to hopefully be able to use our first time home buyer. Something we haven't been able to do with the increase in um, home prices over the past couple of years. But the county is um, has received a first time home buyer home um, grants over the past couple of years, and we look forward to being able to use these hopefully on this this project. Well, it'd be great to make sure we get out through the chambers and through our business associations for their younger employees that they really want to encourage to stay here in Placer County that they're able to acquire these homes. And I love the ADU design so that as a family grows, they can, before they've grown, they can <laughs> rent and supplement their income to some extent with that. Absolutely. Great. Um, I'm not seeing other questions or comments from the board members. Any public comment on this item? Okay, so um, we can take one motion for the three actions, approving the agreement with Halderman Homes, approving the allegation, allocation of up to 500000 and approving a budget amendment in the amount of that 500000 Do I have a motion? Great, thank you, Supervisor Holmes and Wygant. And this is a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yep. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank Shana, you. great job, really great job. Thank you. Okay, we'll move then to item 13A. And Twyla's here, she's been waiting patiently. This is uh, an item for an agreement post-adoptive and guardianship children and families with Koinonia Foster Homes. And it's found on page 977 of the packet. That was a really long title. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried to abbreviate. You did. You did well. <laughs> Twyla Abrahamson, uh, for the record here, the director of the Children's System of Care. And good morning, everyone. Um, I actually was thinking it might be a little later, so this is great. You're doing a wonderful job with the time management. So, as um, uh, Supervisor Gustafson said, this one is for pre and post adoptive and guardianship children and families. 
So back in August of 2018, uh, the Board of Supervisors approved the award of a request for proposals to Koinonia Foster Homes for mental health services for this group of folks, pre and post adoptive and guardianship children. And that particular agreement went from August of 18 through June 30th of 2020. There was a delay in the initial implementation of this contract, however, due to the services not being transitioned from the prior contractor over to this contractor. They claimed continuity of care, which is another thing that they can do to continue services with a prior contractor for a period of, of time until those children no longer needed services. So this was a transition year. So a subsequent contract we had with Koinonia was extended to June 30th, 2022 to address this continued need, stability of the services, and positive outcomes. Koinonia has provided these comprehensive uh, specialty mental health services with specific focus on the issues related to trauma and permanency for youth have been removed from their birth families. And this specialty services is also intended to address the behavioral, emotional, and functional impairments resulting from this trauma, separation, and fam a familial discord. In the past year, Placer County has experienced an increased need for this specialized and trauma-focused therapy as well as other high-needs youth in our community besides the guardianship kids. So with your approval, Koinonia will increase their capacity to serve these children and families through this proposed expanded agreement. So we're requesting that you take the following actions. So approve an agreement with Koinonia Foster Homes for mental health services for pre and post adoptive and guardianship children and families in an amount not to exceed $722,698 for the period of July 1, 2022 to June 30th, 2024, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $72,269, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So the contract expenditures of $361,349 are included in the department's fiscal year 2022-23 budget and the remaining additional same amount will be included in the 23-24 budget. And this contract is funded 87% with state and federal funds and 13% in required county general fund match. So thank you for your consideration and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this item. Thank you, Twyla, appreciate it. Are there any questions, board members? Okay, any public comment on this item? I entertain a motion to approve. Second. Holmes and Wygant on the motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you, Twyla. I think you're up on the next one as well. I am. This is item 13B, page 979. Again, for the record, Twyla Abrahamson, Director of the Children's System of Care. And this item is for Child Advocates of Placer County, and it's an amendment. So Child Advocates of Placer County, through its court-appointed special advocacy, which is the CASA program, provides volunteers to advocate for abused and neglected children, monitor their progress with obtaining medical care, behavioral health care if needed, and their educational attainment. Child Advocates of Placer County, in, in addition to this CASA program, also provides family services to address the special needs of these youth and the additional stress and strain of court involvement with these families. Placer County's Children's System of Care received additional state and federal funding to assist court-involved families, and these additional dollars will allow these specialized family services to expand, along with the creation of a kinship supports for foster youth. The contract is also being requested to be extended to the period ending June 30th, 2025, which aligns with the timeline of the additional state and federal dollars. So we're very shortly requesting that your board take the following actions, approve an amendment with Child Advocates of Placer County to expand services of court-appointed special advocates and family services, increasing the funding by $710,306 for a new total amount not to exceed $858,570, and extending the term for an additional three years for a revised period of July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2025. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent agreements, amendments up to $85,857, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope, 
with risk management and county council concurrence. And this increased amount of $70,019 for this fiscal year 21-22 is funded by the American Rescue Plan Act and it's included in the department's budget and subsequent years will also be included in the department's budget. So no county general fund match is required. So thank you for consideration on this as well and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Are there any questions for Twyla? Not seeing any, any public comment on this item? Entertain. Second. Holmes and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. And one uh, absence on this one. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Twyla. And you're up one more time. One more time. Okay. All right. This one is a little bit longer. Uh, this is an agreement with Victor Community Support Services and the approval of an RFP. So. Assembly Bill AB 403, which many of you heard of me speaking about this many a time, this is continue of care reform, made sweeping changes to California's child welfare system. The intent of the CCR is to provide services and support to children, youth, and their families that reduce reliance on congregate care, thereby increasing placements in community and small home-based settings. The Welfare and Institution Code now requires that county placing agencies convene a child and family meeting, which is a CFTM, to identify supports and services that are needed to achieve permanency, enable a child to live in the least restrictive family home setting, and promote healthy childhood experiences. CFTMs must be held in compliance with regulatory guidelines set forth in AB 403, AB 153, AB 6, uh, 1068, and further outlined in California Department of Social Services all county letters. CFTMs must be convened by a trained facilitator, including all individuals who are involved with the family and youth and are not to be conducted or are to be conducted by a neutral party. While this may be a social worker from the department who is not associated with the case, the children's system of care has used this model for several years now and has determined this would function more effectively and cost efficiently through contracted services. So HHS and procurement work together to de develop request for proposals number 20266 to solicit competitive proposals for this CFTM service in accordance with the guidelines and requirements prescribed by the CCR. After submission of this staff memorandum, however, I discovered an error concerning the dates that the RFP was released and closed. The RFP was released on January 26, 2022, not September 21st, 2021, as the memo states. Only one addendum was issued to clarify the RFP requirements, not three, and the date of the closure of the RFP was February 22nd, 2022, not October 28th, 2021. All other information is correct. Seven firms accessed the RFP and two submitted proposals. Both proposals submitted were determined to be responsive to the submittal requirements of the RFP and were submitted to the evaluation uh, panel for review. The scores were submitted to a procurement who compiled the scores and ranked each for firm accordingly. And the panel members ranking of each firm was unanimous. And we apologize again for the needed, uh, this needed correction in dates. So we are requesting that your board take the following two actions. One is award the request for proposal 20266 to Victor Community Support Services for facilitation of the child and family team meetings, and to approve an agreement with Victor Community Support Services for facilitation in the amount of $595,833 for the period of May 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $59,583 consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work, obviously with risk management and county council concurrence. And finally, the budgeted amount for these services is provided entirely by state revenues and $45,833 is included in the department's fiscal year 2021 or 21-22 budget for the conclusion of this fiscal year, and then the yearly amount of $275,000 will be included in future budgets. And thank you for your consideration on this as well, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Twyla. Are there any questions? Any public comment on this item? Okay, motion? Thank you. 
Thank you. Motion Holmes, second Wygant. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you, Twyla. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Okay, we're going to move on now to item 13D on operation of a service center agreements with at 4 the Placer County Government Center. Thanks, Amy, for being here. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Um, for the record, I'm Amy Ellis uh, with the Adult System of Care with an action item to a, an approve an agreement with the Gathering In for operation of a service center at the Placer County Government Center in the amount not to exceed $133,117 for the period of May 1st through June 30th, 2023, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $13,311 dollars consistent with the agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence through community and partner agency requests health and human services was asked to consider the possibility of offering a service center to better engage the unsheltered in the auburn region in an effort to be expedient in response to better coordinate care this contract for a service center will be initiated as a pilot on the placer county government center uh, campus it will operate Monday through Fridays, four to five hours each day. The service center is expected to serve approximately 10 to 30 individuals, but will be open to all. Um, the uh, service center is expected to provide the following services, brief shelter, restrooms, housing support, benefit linkage, um, service linkage, legal referral, transportation support, computer and mail access, and more. Initially, the service center will be located at 11512B Avenue, Auburn, California, the same location that the Welcome Center was prior on the P PCGC campus, while alternative locations will be continue to be evaluated. This small pilot will allow us to assess the need, seek input on future service delivery design, and consider size and location needs. The Gathering Inn has experience with this population, making them an ideal organization to operate this pilot. Because of the time sensitive nature of the proposed service center pilot um, center, we request that TGI run the operations of the proposed service center for a 14 month period, which would allow us to go through the competitive request for proposal process and also assess the results of the service center pilot. The department will absorb $22,630 within our fiscal year 21-22 adult system of care budget with no additional general fund contribution. The balance of $110,487 will be included in the fiscal year 22-23 department budget. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. And I want to clarify for the record, we're taking action and you're presenting on item 13D1. Correct. And, and we're dropping a 13D2 from the the agenda from this, this will be agenda. brought back at a later time okay so we'll bring that item back correct sorry discussed. yes thanks for that clarification yeah I just want to make sure it's clear for the public um, okay are there questions supervisor Holmes yeah I, uh, thank you Amy uh, this is to replace what was called the welcome center is that correct it'll be a different service design yeah. than the welcome center this will specifically target those the needs of the unsheltered population okay good any other comments? I would just thank staff for jumping on this so quickly after all of our discussions with the situation um, at the government center and making sure that we're providing those services. Really appreciate how quickly you worked on, on this. Um, and I wanna appreciate the gathering in for being so helpful as partners as well because it's an impact to them as well to get this up and running so quickly, so. Great. I don't see any other questions here. Are there any public comments? Kathleen, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Okay, hi, my name is Kathleen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually, I do have a comment, but I have a question first. I got on here just to see that my Zoom was working and um, I expected this to come up at two o'clock. Is, is there not gonna be a 1.30 and two o'clock? Did I miss the 1.30 number nine comments? That, that's a different item that will be on at two o'clock. Oh, okay. And so, but this one is at two o'clock. This was for 13D. Um, I'm requesting our board deny 
the um, gathering in request for the service center for the housing support, transportation, computer access, and mail access. All of these services are in place in Placer County. Placer homeless can use buses, the library, and the post office like tax paying citizens do. Stop f spoon feeding these individuals. Humans need a goal to earn self respect. They succeed when their goals are accomplished, no matter how small. By spoon feeding them and handing them everything along the way, society is robbing of this. All the money requested can go towards the well-planned and well-thought-out center in South Placer. I do respect and acknowledge what the gathering has done, but enough is enough. Throwing good money after bad. It's just not working. Thank you, and I'll have my other comments for um, 2 o'clock. Thank you, Kathleen. Appreciate that. And your comments, are there any other public comments on this item? I see no other public comments. Okay, thank you very much. Second. Motion Holmes, second Wygant. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Then we'll move on to item 13E, re Adult Residential Treatment Services and Medication Support Services for the Mentally Disabled. Amy, I'll turn it over. Okay, um, morning again. Amy Ellis for the record with the Adult System of Care with an action item to approve an agreement with Compassion that Pathway Behavioral Health, LLC, to provide adult residential treatment services and medication support services for mentally disabled adults for the period of April 1st, 2022 uh, through June 30th, 2023 in the amount not to exceed $800,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign amendments not to exceed $80,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and County Council concurrence. Compassionate Pathway uh, Behavioral Health LLC is a brand new six bed adult residential facility that is opening in Roseville, California, approximately five minutes from Kirby Hills Clinic. Uh, the facility is a sister facility to Compassion Valley LLC with whom ASOC has had an agreement to provide similar services located in Sacramento County. They will, um, let's see, they will provide support and recovery services to up to six clients. Their mission is to reduce readmissions into acute care, hospitals, emergency rooms, and other higher levels of care. ASOC has had a positive, um, positive, positive outcomes with this particular organization. They are able to successfully serve clients who require high levels of care. And as an bonus, extra bonus, this facility allows clients um, to be placed closer to home that would otherwise need to go to remote parts of the California and they're able to bill Medi-Cal for many of the services that they provide, which is um, great for us. So this uh, agreement includes 75% in federal funding, 4% in state funding, and 21% in county general funds. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy. Any questions, board members? Not seeing any, any public comment on this item? Okay, and entertain a motion. Second. Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And we have one absence. Okay, we'll move on then to item 13F, Substance Use Treatment Services with Recover Medical Group PC. Amy Ellis again here uh, with the Adult System of Care with an action item for your board to um, approve an uh, agreement with Recover Medical Group PC for substance use treatment services from April 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 for a total amount not to exceed $456,300 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $45,630 consistent with agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Placer County has been providing drug medical organized delivery services since November 1st, 2018. Since its inception, Placer County has used both in-county providers as well as providers from neighboring counties to be able to have 
um, are, are needs met. The primary goals of these services are to provide eligible beneficiaries access to substance use treatment, to provide a system of care that helps them achieve sustainable recovery, and to reduce substance use within the community. It is the mission of Placer County Health and Human Services to offer a vast array of services and to make treatment easily accessible. So Recovery Medical Group PC will be a new outpatient SUD provider to the Placer County Continuum of Care and a first of its kind, being an exclusively telehealth model that has received drug Medi-Cal certification from the state. They will primarily serve residents in the Lake Tahoe area and other remote areas that have difficulties accessing existing services. Expanding treatment options in the Lake Tahoe area is needed due to the limited number of provider options available, current prov provider staffing challenges, and to further increase access to treatment. Funding for these mandated services com is comprised of 90% federal and state funds and 10% county general funds and is included in our budget. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Amy. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any. I'd entertain a motion. Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Good boy, one, two, two more items to go. So we've been you. really busy. Yes, um. you have been. <laughs> hey, this is item 13G. Yes. Um, oh, Amy Ellis, again, for the record, uh, with the Adult System of Care. Uh, with an, two action items today to adopt a resolution ratifying the Director of Health and Human Services grant application for $6,169,970 from the State Department of Health Care Services Behavioral Health California Infrastructure Program, otherwise known as BHCIP, for a site at the Placer County Government Center and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services um, to sign the resulting agreement and all related paperwork with risk management and county council concurrence. The second is to adopt a resolution ratifying the Director of Health and Human Services a, grant, a second grant application for $349,045 from the State Behavioral Health California Infrastructure Program for a site at the Home Key Round 2 proposed location and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the resulting agreements and all related paperwork with risk management and county council concurrence. So the State Department of Healthcare Services ha, um, was authorized through a 2021 legislation to establish the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program um, and awarded, they were awarded approximately $2.1 billion to be used by, de by December 2026 to construct, acquire, and expand properties and invest in mobile crisis infrastructure related to behavioral health. There are six rounds of funding that have been and will be presented to the county and other organizations as, as opportunity to expand existing resources. Round three, this current round, uh, funding will be awarded to those applicants who have projects that are considered launch ready. The uh, launch ready means you are able to begin immediate work towards acquiring or repurpor repurposing land or space for behavioral health services and programs. Placer County has initiated the two separate applications for these launch ready round three grant funds, which have been sent to the department for review and consideration. The first action is uh, requesting approval for a proposal to repurpose a county owned property on the Placer County Government Center campus. Um, it's the site that was previously the medical clinic for those who've been around a while. We have proposed to repurpose this vacated building to construct a 24-7 behavioral health respite center for 10 to 16 adults and children that is open to the public and residents in need of short-term behavioral health crisis services. This project is an innovative, innovative approach that will help serve as an alternative to restrictive and costly psychiatric health facility admissions and better provide our community with another option for someone in crisis. The second action is to approve a similar proposal but located um, at 110 North Sunrise Avenue in Roseville. It's the home of the current 
project room key hope to be project home key. This would, of course, be dependent on receiving and getting approval on that particular acquisition, obviously. But if all of those pieces come together, this would provide additional funding to convert the first floor of, the, of that location to be renovated to accommodate 12 to 16 adults also in a 24-7 behavioral health respite center type facility that would be adult, open to adult residents and to the public to receive um, mental health uh, crisis support. This project will likewise provide an alternative option to restrictive and costly psychiatric hospitalization options. If awarded this, these these grants, Health and Human Services could receive up to $6,519,015 in revenue. If applicable, the 10% match fund requirement will be met with the value of the property or funds that are available in the department's fiscal year 21-22 budget. Any questions on this one? Yes, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Amy. Uh, question for you, I, th I mean, I think this is a, uh, a good way to utilize some state funds to address a need that we have uh, with the proposal of the two projects and based on your experience right you're talking 24 plus beds um, how much of a need do we have for that um, I would um, I, I know that we could utilize all of those spaces as of now. So all those contracts that I bring to your board for additional puffs means that our puff is constantly at capacity. And then we send as many of those individuals that we have room for to other counties and other facilities. So these facilities would be an alternative to that, more cost effective, more humane, some might say, like a different option than a psychiatric hospitalization to receive crisis care. So we definitely have need in our community. Um, we're probably one of the largest counties um, that doesn't have facilities like this already within their communities. Okay, so it would allow for us to take care of some needs here in our own county versus sending people to different counties to receive some of these same type of services. Yeah, and in voluntary settings and involuntary, so there's more options than just an involuntary path pathway to treatment. Great, thank you. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Amy. Um, so if a family member uh, is suffering a mental health crisis, can the family bring them this individual to this place? Is that what this place is set up for? Yeah, so there's time to be able to work with partners and get input on the design and, th and answer questions like that. This stage one, because it was so quick and we had to turn it around for a launch ready, is really just to get the facility ready. Uh -huh. We'll, after it's kind of in progress of if we get the award and we're able to start to rehabilitate the property, we'll be able to get community input, design it, put out an RFP, seek services, and then be able to address a lot of those questions. But I mean, but yes, ideally, this would be a drop-off location, easy to access, 24-7, law enforcement, family members, self-referrals. I mean, we want to make it easy to access. Good. Thank you. Well, Supervisor Jones, did you have a question earlier? Okay. Um, Amy, my question would be, so it's voluntary? Um, again, I think that depends on how we design it. I think... Um, Definitely, at least one of these locations will have voluntary options. It'll depend on community need. Um, if we need more areas for involuntary, if that's what's going to help, like the hospitals and our partners and our law enforcement partners to be able to bring them on holds, then we would will design it that way. If we want it to be voluntary before they get to that level, we can design it that way. That is kind of yet to be determined. Okay, so there could be uh, additional security and those measures that'll need to take place. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'm not seeing other questions. Are there, are there any public comments on this item? Okay, motion. Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Not seeing any. Thank you, Amy. You have one more, 13H. Yeah, one more this morning. You'll see me again this uh. afternoon. <laughs> Um, good morning, Chair. Uh, oh, I already said that. 
Amy Ellis, again with the Adult System of Care, with an action item to approve an amendment with North Valley Behavioral Health for Psychiatric Health Services at their Yuba City locations, increasing the agreement by $1,200,000 for a new total amount not to exceed $3.3 million for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2023, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Placer County continues to see, as we just spoke about, high volumes of individuals in crisis who require acute inpatient level of care, such as a psychiatric health facility. Since the Kirby Hills um, PUF is consistently at capacity, it remains necessary to find alternative treatment locations for Placer residents in crisis requiring this highest level of service. The numbers of those um, individuals experiencing a mental health crisis requiring inpatient level of care has continued to increase over the past 12 months, and the need for additional PUFs such as these are high. So given the higher than, than expected volume of referrals and their change in daily rates effective July 1, 2022, this amendment is being requested. These services provide necessary life-saving and stabilizing care. and. Um, and it's a less expensive supportive treatment option than, um, than other options that we have in locked facilities. So funding for this agreement consists of 67% in state and federal funding and 33% in county general funds. Any questions? Any questions for me? Yes, Supervisor Holmes. I don't have a question. I just have a comment um, and I'm gonna support this item. Supervisor Gore and I serve on the Homeless Outreach Ad, Ad Hoc Committee and occasionally people say, well, what's the county doing about this issue? We just are approving eight items uh, regarding adoption services, uh, childhood trauma, uh, child welfare, homeless support, behavioral mental health, crisis, mental health crisis. Uh, so uh, I think it needs to be recognized that actually we're doing as much as we can, and I appreciate all the work that Health and Human Services does. Uh, and thank you for staying here and, <laughs> and for being with us for all these items. So I'm just uh, so grateful for that we're able to do these kinds of things. Well, we appreciate this board's support. Okay. And I move approval if it's not too early. Well, we haven't taken public comment yet, so we'll just ask if there's any public comment on this item. Not seeing any, then yes, Supervisor Holmes made a motion. And Supervisor Wygant with a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Amy, I wanted to echo Supervisor Holmes' comments. Um, and I think it's so important to let our public know all of the services and how, um, how our Health and Human Services Department is securing as much state and federal funding to help with these issues as possible. Um, we, we have tremendous issues. And we need to put tools in the hands of our law enforcement and our medical profession, health and human services, so that we can serve these individuals. It is our mission to expand service and treatment options, so thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully the next item is short, Suzanne. This is item 14A on page 995 of our uh, board packet, creation and abolishment of various classifications. Good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board. I will try to make this very short. Before you today is a request to update the uncodified schedule classifications and compensation ordinance to create a new classification series related to electrical instrument and control technicians. We're asking that we create a one-two position, a senior level position, and a supervising position. We're also requesting that the animal services program coordinator classification be added to that list. And then as part of our general cleanup, um, we are asking that the architectural assistant one, two, document solution supervisor and engineering aid classifications be abolished. With regard to the new class series, the Department of Public Works and PPO had approached HR probably about last summer and expressed some concerns with recruitment and retention issues with a specific team that's assigned to service and maintain the county's 54 wastewater lift stations within the county. There are more lift stations that are anticipated to be created or established. When we looked at the local market 
for agencies that included wastewater lift stations. We found that many agencies are starting to carve out a separate classification to address this effect. We also realized that due to the um, increased technical knowledge required, there were some, some electrical licenses that were also a prerequisite to perform that work. Therefore, we created the new series, and you can see the proposed salaries that are re recommended on the ordinance. Those were based on both an internal alignment analysis as well as an analysis of the local market, which was a little different than our standard because we were looking at local agencies that were comparable in terms of having those wastewater lift stations. With regard to the animal services program coordinator, that was a request that came from our department of HHS. As you know, our, our animal shelter is a no-kill shelter. Therefore, there are many efforts in terms of getting foster care, volunteers, and, and coordinating the effort to keep that, um, that status in the shelter. In the past, this was used with a contract employee or an extra help person. And what we're finding is that obviously there's AB5 implications of using long-term contract employees. And we're also seeing that this is really a full-time job function that needs to be addressed on a permanent basis. Therefore, we've established that new classification of animal services program coordinator. With the abolishments, architectural assistant and engineering aid, those classifications haven't been filled on a permanent basis in over 20 years. So we thought after talking to the departments, it's time to clean that up. The document solution supervisor was last um, filled back in 2019, which is fairly recent, but the job duties assigned to that position have been absorbed by our document solutions manager and our newly established records coordinator. So with that, I will happy to answer any questions you might have. Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you. Just a comment. Um, I was at Animal Services last week and was holding an itty bitty adorable little kitten. So really the way to get people to foster, adopt, or adopt animals is just take them over to the Animal <laughs> Services Center and let them hold a kitten or a puppy and they're goners. Fortunately, I did not adopt. I was going to say, uh, did you adopt? Question. I thought about it. I thought about it and then I knew that that would not go over as well at home, especially with my dog. So mm -hmm. decided not to, but uh, thank you. Appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks, Suzanne. Any other comments or questions? Any public comment on this item? Okay. Entertain a motion. Motion Gore, second Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. The next three items are related to each other, and we have quite a team here to talk about these. Um, items 16, 17, and 18 related to Assembly Bill 481. So we're going to start with our Sheriff's Department. Good morning, Shane Wright, Plaster County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Captain Troy Sander, Plaster County Sheriff's Office. So we're here to, for the first time, uh, introduce our public safety military equipment policy, which was a result of AB 481. A uh, quick overview of how we got here today. Uh, basically, in 1997, there was uh, a lot of people were familiar with the North Hollywood shootout. Uh, two suspects, heavily armed heavily armored, um, put up a very long and um, devastating fight against many, many officers um, at, with the Southern California Law Enforcement Agency. As a result of that, uh, many law enforcement agencies across the state, and as we're seeing more and more of these types of situations um, shifted to catch up with these free-thinking adversaries and, and the way that they're adapting. so. Uh, basically, a lot of law enforcement agencies elected to um, acquire military-type equipment. Um, fast forward to the George Floyd movement. Um, demonstrations, some of those demonstrations turned into uh, riots. Some law enforcement agencies chose to have uh, armored vehicles. Um, whether or not um, best practice, um, not sure, but optically, uh, Assemblyman Chu did not like it and bas basically authored a bill to provide more transparency and more uh, community and another gov governing body to, um, for law enforcement agencies. 
Thank you, Shane, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, as my partner had mentioned, 481 basically was uh, specified military equipment. Uh, came from the 1033 program, a lot of the things that we got from the government through the years to help fund our operations without causing fiscal impact increases. Um, we like to re, uh, term that, it's basically safety equipment. It's safety equipment we've been using for the latter part of almost 20 years. There's only a few things we've added to our inventory that, that are new. So what 481 requires is that it requires that we uh, have a policy specifying equipment used by the Sheriff's Office. The policy must be approved by the Board of Supervisors. Policy must be available on our website and has been and it posted for uh, over 30 days. It requires us to provide an annual report will be, uh, which will be open to the public and submitted to the Board of Supervisors. The intent of 41 really is to uh, increase the transparency of equipment the fiscal, and to justify the fiscal, fiscal impacts and quantities and uses. Uh, also built within that is a complaint process that needs to be included uh, in the annual report and available on our webpage, which has uh, been uh, up and running since we uh, started this process. Next slide. Okay, so here you'll see it's, which <coughs> obviously is uh, published in our policy and available to everybody. Um, this is um, a list of the main items inside of that policy. Um, when we conclude, when we get more towards the conclusion of this presentation, I'm more than happy to go into um, the why we have it, and maybe provide an example of what we experienced locally of why we have it, or lessons learned across the state and across the nation of um, why we chose to, to have this equipment and um, stay with it. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is the sheriff's always been very transparent with the community. Um, from the day with the deputy, which I've seen um, all of you at, uh, to our days with uh, the special enforcement team. Um, there has been, there's no secret Connex box, basement. Um, what you see is what you get at all these demos. Um, and we've been fully transparent with this over the last probably couple decades. So we're gonna play a short video for you showing uh, the use of the 40 millimeter, one of the de-escalation tools that we've had in our inventory for a couple of years now. Um, this individual you'll see here, this was the conclusion of this event. Prior to this, which is not included for time, is this individual basically um, stalking one of our deputies around her patrol vehicle uh, where she made several laps in trying to negotiate and de-escalate with this individual and it didn't work, and this is the culmination of this incident. As you can see, you know, he was armed with a large uh, screwdriver. Um, there's not a lot of options when you're negotiating with someone like this in this, in this particular situation. The 40 was deployed successfully able to knock the weapon out of the hand and deputies were able to apprehend the suspect and take him into custody safely. Next slide. This slide is, shows, uh, this was a, a clandestine marijuana operation that was involved in se uh, severe criminality and distribution of marijuana. Uh, this was the execution of the search warrant. It'll show you two things. One, it'll show the delivery of the team into the incident in the Bearcat, which is also known as basically a moving shield. And it will also show you that a uh, suspect fleeing from the scene and running into the field. If we did not have the drone overhead, we would never have probably found the individual. So with that, Shane. So top screen, you'll see the Bearcat coming in. Typically, there's uh, team members inside that Bearcat. They'll start uh, communications with the individuals with inside. And then the rema remainder of the team comes out. Suspect flees and he's running through the field. The drone operator is making communication to the team at this time that there's a, a suspect fleeing. You'll see the excursion at the top of the screen come down. So team members are dealing with two suspects now, one in the field and one up by the building. That's conclusion. And the last thing we wanted to bring up, uh, Shane, will you come in this one? Sure. Okay. 
Yes, so also covered under this policy is the mobile command vehicle. First, so for law enforcement, mobile command vehicles are uh, included. And uh, this, I think many of you are well aware that uh, this has been used locally. One of the most uh, recent ones was on the River Fire, the Colfax incident, and I was out there for no less than two weeks, and it provided a uh, uh, command post near the f in, in the field um, for all of our partners to meet at. It provided um, basically a um, communications network for us with uh, being able to merge all of our radio frequencies um, as well as all the technology that comes with it, with the computers, the plotter, the dispatch center, and everything else. So this is just another thing um, that falls under that policy. So um, as the slide shows, um, all items have uh, already been approved and purchased um, within the budget. A lot of these items we've had for well over um, two decades. And uh, basically the action requested is to introduce a uncodified ordinance waive oral reading approving the continued use of public safety equipment acquired prior to January 1st, 2022 and adopt the Sheriff's Office AB 41 public safety equipment policy in accordance with government code section 7070 through 7075 for the use of specified equipment. And we're happy to answer any questions. I see questions already. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, captains. Uh, so I see your folks, you folks out in the, you know, at the fair or public events and parades, you have this equipment out. So, you know, you're, it's on display. Um, and I've seen it many, many times. And much of those items that you had uh, uh, on the screen, you can buy at uh, Amazon. So I don't know what the deal is, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm fully in support of it, taking this action. Thank you. Actually, that yes, was Supervisor Gore. My, my comment as well. A number of these are publicly attainable, like the drones, ammunition, um, and you know I I appreciate uh, you bringing this to us. Uh, it's fine that the public is aware that we utilize this equipment. That you, not we, you all utilize this equi equipment to make sure our community is safe, um, and. You know, so I just appreciate the work you're doing, and I certainly appreciate um, just the efforts to make sure that the information is available, the public are aware, um, but you still need to have the equipment you need to uh, provide the services for not only our community, but also keeping your deputies safe. I think that's the other part of this, which is really important, right? Our community needs to be safe, but you all need to be safe in the work um, that you're charged to do, so I appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor Wygant. I'll just pile on with my additional thanks. Um, one, appreciate the uh, transparency and the uh, aggressive approach you're taking to that in and of itself. But beyond that, um, as we look across the country in these strange and divisive times, there are places that have argued for defunding the police, and some of the crime statistics are just despicable. Um, so fortunately in Placer County, we have chosen not to do that. Uh, we have an intelligently uh, um, sized and financed public protection system, which is a complete system, which a lot of folks don't, don't appreciate. And uh, a couple of weeks ago in our budget workshops, uh, Under Sheriff Wayne Wu reported that we have continued decreasing crime statistics, uh, essentially and generally here in Placer County. So. Uh, just a great opportunity to be able to articulate some of those things and look forward to continuing to partner well with the sheriff's office. Thanks. Supervisor Jones. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, I know I told you this before, that having experience being an Army spouse, I worked for the Department of Transportation, the D Army Department of Transportation, and the Army Criminal Investigation Division. And part of the reason that they developed military equipment was to protect their soldiers during conflict and so the evolution of this equipment into the civilian sector only makes sense because the purpose of it all is to protect your your team your officers during these um, criminal events and these days with all of the things that criminals are armed with i think it's important that you guys be able to protect yourselves as well and i do remember that shootout in la where the female officer laid wounded and bleeding to death because they couldn't get to her with all the 
crossfire and that the uh, criminals were shooting, they couldn't even get to her. So having some type of an armored vehicle or something to be able to move over there and pick her up and take her to safety and, and to the hospital is critical. And I don't know why anyone would not want you to be able to protect yourselves from severe harm and or death. So I'm all in favor. Even here in Placer County, that our, our Bearcat, our moving shield has been shot at several times with our deputies being deployed into critical incidents to stabilize the incident or to provide a protective bubble so it doesn't uh, move out further in the community. So um, it's been a very valuable asset for us. Great, and I would just wrap up with the uh, echoing my colleagues' comments, but also augmenting them that even though much of this is available publicly, what we're all afraid of is what their criminals are getting that isn't available publicly, and you need to be protected the best we possibly can uh, in your careers. So we so appreciate this effort, the transparency that this will bring for those who maybe aren't paying attention, they should be, um, that uh, we have this equipment and that we will use it when we need to. Uh, and with the right judgment that you always use and that uh, we entrust in you. So um, with that, uh, is there any public comment on this item? Not seeing any, then I would ask for a motion to introduce an uncodified ordinance waive. <laughs> I was gonna read the action, but that's okay. Supervisor Jones. Second. And second, Supervisor Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Next item is uh, following up on that discussion with our district attorney's office, and the same requirements hold true with Assembly Bill 481. Good morning. <laughs> Just push that button so that we can hear you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Green. I'm the Chief Investigator for the Plaster County District Attorney's Office. Thank you, uh, Chair Gustafsson and the fellow board members for having us here today. Um, what I was saying when my microphone was off is that this is going to be remarkably familiar to you all. Um, AB 481, as you are all familiar, uh, is codified into law as Government Code 7070 through 7075. And it requires law enforcement agencies to go before the governing board and receive approval for the equipment that they have that falls within the jurisdiction of this. Uh, the public as well as the board have been provided with a copy of this our ordinance with a small typo that has been corrected. Um, this information must be available on our website. We will provide an annual report to the public as well as to our governing body, our board of supervisors. And this is really just to ensure transparency of equipment, any fiscal impact that this may have, justifications for the equipment that we have, the amount of equipment that we have, the ways that we use the equipment, and any reporting and complaint processes. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Lieutenant Dudo, to talk about the equipment that we do have. Good morning, Lieutenant Vince Dudo, Placer County District Attorney's Investigations Unit. Thank you for having me. I'll talk just a little bit about our equipment that uh, fell under Assembly Bill 481. We have three types of equipment in our unit. We had uh, our unmanned aerial vehicle, otherwise known as a drone. Uh, we have the DJI Inspire 2. As uh, some of our uh, supervisors have pointed out, it is a publicly available drone. Uh, what's different about, our, about ours from other law enforcement agencies is we specifically equipped and uh, uh, purposed our drone for crime scene uh, documentation and then later using those photos, videos, and scans for court presentation. We've received a lot of really positive feedback from our deputy district attorneys in court as well as our Placer County citizens that sit on our jury panels. They love our drone footage that we're using in the cases we prosecute. The other type of equipment that we had that fell under AB 41 was our rifles. Those are issued to our investigators uh, in our investigations unit and on our special teams. We have 17 sworn uh, DA investigators in our unit, including management, uh, and we have 15 total rifles. And the third part was the ammunition that goes with those rifles. Uh, we have two types. We, there's a, a less expensive ammunition we use for training, and then what we call our duty ammunition, and that's what's used in the rifles for duty service. We do have a, cup, uh, a video and a photo to show you the use of our drones. We'll have our DA investigator, Ryan Bow, who is our licensed drone operator here, to answer any questions on that. 
I like to call him our drone pilot. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Ryan Bell, that's together with the DA's office. So uh, as you'll see here, this is a video of a uh, off uh, of a DUI accident that occurred where a vehicle rolled down a steep embankment and uh, utilizing the drone to obtain this uh, footage and videos, as you'll see here. How do you? I don't know how to play. Allowed us to uh, much more safely obtain the evidence we needed to provide the court. Instead of having a whole bunch of investigators go down to take photos and videos, we could fly around the scene. Um, and then at the same time, uh, a lot cheaper than having a helicopter come out and try to get the same type of um, images for us. But as you'll see how far that vehicle fell down that hill uh, as they collided. And down at the bottom, you can see where the, the vehicle is in comparison to where the roadway was. Um, so and then the uh, following is a photograph from uh, where Chrissy Wilson was recovered uh, recently. Um, and it, this again just helps show the proximity of uh, the residents. And in, right in the center of the screen is ultimately uh, where she was found. And this is how we've been able to use um, the drone to get the images we need to support our scenes. <coughs> Okay, so we're requesting um, that you adopt our, uh, that you introduce an uncodified ordinance to waive oral reading, approving the continued use of public safety equipment acquired prior to January 1, 2022, as, and the district attorney's military <coughs> equipment policy as required by California Government Code 770 through 775 for the use of specified equipment. Again, all of these items have been used for years. They've been purchased within budget, and they're only used in a, a very specified situation to increase public safety officer safety, uh, respond uh, to rapidly evolving events and to document our crime scenes. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Any questions or comments? I'm sure we all support the comments we just made to our sheriffs um, with the same support um, that you're protecting our Placer County residents um, and making sure that we do it efficiently and effectively and safely for our staff too. So with that, are there any public comments? Okay, then I'd accept a motion. Okay, motion Wygant, second Jones. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we have the probation department, again on Assembly Bill 481, Public Safety Equipment Use Policy. Good morning. Good morning. Chair Gustafson, board members, Mr. Leopold and Ms. Schwab. <clears throat> the action requested this morning is to introduce an ordinance waive oral reading, approving the continued use of public safety equipment acquired prior to January 1st, 2022 in the probation department's public safety equipment unmanned aerial system operations policy in accordance with government code sections 7070 and 7075. My name is Meredith Murdoch with the Placer County Probation Department. Our drone, the DJ Mavic, can be purchased locally by any citizen and provides numerous advantages to our agency. We currently use our drone for identifying and surveying campsites, which allows us to cover a larger area in a shorter amount of time. In turn, we are able to reach more of our unsheltered population in order to provide services and programming. It also has been used to take before and after photos of camps as far as cleanup efforts. Additionally, our drone has been a positive tool for public relations and not only captures the events, but it's a great way for us to engage with our public. So again, we are requesting that our action this morning to introduce an ordinance, wave oral reading, approving the continued use of our public safety equipment, our drone, in accordance with government code sections 7070 and 7075. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Meredith. Um, any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Well, again, ditto on our previous comments. Thank Appreciate you for it. having this equipment. It's readily available to the public. It makes me wonder why it's in this category. That's up to our state legislature to change, but in the meantime, um, happy to do, take the actions necessary to support your continued use. Um, are there any public comments on this item? 
With that, I'd entertain a motion. Wygand and Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think with that, we will be coming back for a couple of timed items this afternoon, but now we're going to adjourn to close session. Karen, will you? The board will now adjourn to close session to consider three items of existing litigation, three potential cases of anticipated litigation. The labor negotiation item is being dropped from close session agenda. Okay. Good afternoon. It's now 1.15 and we're going to readjourn the Board of Supervisors meeting and we'll take a report out of closed session. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, Boyle versus County of Placer, the board heard a report and provided direction. Placer County Deputy Sheriff's Association versus County, the board heard a report no action requested or taken. Placer County Deputy uh, Sheriff's Association versus County, board heard a report, no action requested or taken. Under anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, the board heard a report and provided direction. Under potential exposure to litigation, the board heard a report on two potential cases and provided direction on each of those potential cases. That concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate that. And we are now going to move on to our 150 timed item, item 8 on our agenda, which can be found on page 531 of our board packet. Uh, and this is the appointment of the at-large East of the Sierra Crest Planning Commissioner. Um, and with that, I know that we have three applicants for this position. Um, I believe two can, are with us here in the room today, and one may join us. We'll look for that. Um, and we wanted to give an opportunity for each of the applicants to uh, address the board, if you so choose. And brag about yourself. It's afternoon. I can joke even more today. My least favorite thing to do is brag about myself. <laughs> So, um, thank you for the opportunity to be considered for a Placer County Planning Commissioner for the Eastern Slope. It's an honor to be considered in the first place. I just want to start, and I, I know there's a timer somewhere, so someone's going to stop me. Okay. I just want to go back in history a little bit and tell you how long I've been involved in the community. For those of you who can remember the Forest Hill Forum, when it was called the Forest Hill Forum, I was on that commission. That was my beginning in a political type world or, or helping to give back to the community. And from there I moved forward to being on the fire department there and the safety club and immerse myself in the community of Forest Hill for years and years. And then I decided to get involved in Auburn and all of you know me as the former mayor of Auburn three times and on the city council for 13 years. Prior to that, I was the planning commissioner for the city of Auburn and served as its chair at that time. And I am currently the chair for the city of Auburn right now. And I am not used to being on this side of the podium. <laughs> so give me a moment. One of the reasons why I'm interested, of course, is in being a planning commissioner. For those of you that know me, Ms. Jones is the one who knows me the least. I've worked with all of you for several years, including on SACOG, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, um, Tahoe Truckee Airport Land Use Commission, uh, SACOG, Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority, as well as many state boards that I've worked with you jointly in order to make our community a, a, a greater place to live, work, and play. My life in, Ta in the Tahoe area, in the eastern Tahoe area, has at nine years old, I started skiing at Squaw Valley. My dad is known as a Squaw Valley legend. You can find all his photos at the top of the Chamois in the bar up there where 
He was an icon for Squaw, and that was the start of my life in Tahoe. And then I realized Tahoe had summers. And so I started doing summers and backpacking, hiking, biking, and caring about keeping Tahoe as clear and clean and safe and doing development correctly. So in my working career as a job, I worked for a title insurance company in their land entitlement division where I worked with builders and developers building proper, safe, good communities. So my clients were Squaw Valley, Sugar Bowl, North Star, at Martis Camp, Schaefer's Mill, just to name a few. So I understand good, smart projects. I understand how the planning process works, and it'd be an honor if you would nominate me as your planning commissioner. Thank you. Appreciate Questions? that. <laughs> Questions? No, we don't need okay. to interrogate today. <laughs> if they do have some, I'll ask them later. Scott, would you like to address us? And did Jim join us online? I have not seen he wasn't thinking he'd be able to. We did receive an email from him. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this came about approximately 64 years ago. I was born in Truckee. Uh, odd story here. The, uh, my mom was in a car wreck, and I was born in the emergency room. When I moved back to Lake Tahoe about 12 years ago, I had to have my first colonoscopy, and little did I know that I was going back to the same room that I was born in. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange circle, but anyway. Uh, it might be TMI. <laughs> it probably <laughs> is, but that's kind of As my I kids know. would tell me. Yeah. Uh, my grandson's coming to Lake Tahoe uh, when he graduates from high school in Carlsbad this fall, or this spring, and he will be the fifth generation of uh, Wil Wilson people that have lived there. Uh, my dad moved there in 1957 with my mom. I was born there, uh, outdoorsman. He was an administrator at Tal Truckee High School, uh, built spec homes on the North Shore of Lake Tahoe, was dear friends with Larry Sevison, and that's kind of one of the reasons I'm here, is because I'm close with the Sevison family. Um, Lake Tahoe is at a, a teetering point, and uh, I think we all know it. It really hit me about five years ago after the 4th of July, and having lived down in San Diego County and being in the water, uh, you can see a lot of the currents, and when you see the currents, they tend to bring in trash, plastic. After the 4th of July, I was kayaking out there, and in Lake Tahoe, that's starting to happen. And we need to be really aware of that because that's a gem. That's, uh, I've traveled a lot of places in the world, and every time I come back to Tahoe, it's the most beautiful place I've seen. So anyway, I retired in September and wanted to take a few months off to determine exactly what I wanted to do. But I knew that I wanted to be able to give back to the communities that I was from. Uh, my background is basically in sales and management, in sales for 42 years, 39 years in management, uh, retired as the Western sales director for a company called Impact Products that uh, one of their divisions during COVID was insane. We did uh, disposable gloves, face masks, and PPE. And so I would travel 50% of the time. That was cut off completely. So I had to work in the office in my house and uh, have the best sales in my career. And it was really nice. I was working two or three hours a day. So it was a great segue into uh, retirement. Also spent a lot of time uh, with companies such as uh, Frito-Lay, one of the Pepsi companies, uh, Anheuser-Busch, where I was in mid-level mid management. Did a lot of projects and programs rolling out things like Tostitos, Chips, Santitas. Uh, moved on to a company called Legas, which is the biggest redistributor in the uh, janitorial sanitation world. And they deal with companies such as Clorox, Colgate, Palmolive, Kimberly Clark, and they sell them to people that are distributors such as Sacval, that's I think one of the distributors here. And my predominant job there was strategic accounts where I would meet with the Orox people and figure out a way for them to sell their products to somebody in Eureka, California or North Carolina. 
And you have to bring a lot of different people together to the table to make the right decisions. And those were the projects and the programs and the development that I really feel like I can utilize my skills for the planning commission job, because it's pretty easy. Uh, no matter who you are, we're all human beings. And uh, probably 95% of the things we truly believe in, we agree on. It's that 5% that we allow the problems to happen. And if you can just simply talk to people, find out what your commonalities are, and move forward and uh, do the right thing, I think you've got a wonderful thing. So thank you very much. Look forward to working with Placer County in some way. You know, I hope it's this, but some way. Please know that I'm there and uh, I'm very interested. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. We'll check one more time to see if Jim's available. Well, I'd ask the indulgence of the board, unless you have questions, I had a, a couple comments to make. Um, and I greatly appreciate it. I mean, it's rare, I think, uh, for anyone to really want to be in public service these days. I mean, it, it takes special people, and this county is full of them. Uh, and I think it's so evidenced by the three <coughs> quality candidates we had um, for this open position. Um, and understanding how critical the nature is of um, decisions that come to us from our planning commission and how important it is to have that knowledge um, both of the East Slope when the project, uh, when that position was first designated, um, but now with so much activity on the West, uh, it is really critical that we have people that are willing and able to serve and, and, um, and knowledgeable about the entire county. And I had the opportunity to interview all three of the, the candidates and talk at length with them. Um, and I've shared with them um, uh, my decision yesterday. Um, certainly the rest of the board, I, I do need two votes on that. And I shared that with them as well. So there could be other nominations. Um, but I wanted to uh, let you know that I was going to nominate Bridget Powers for this position uh, on the, on the uh, planning commission. And it's not, um, all of the candidates are well qualified, and certainly the private sector experience that both Jim and Scott share um, in <coughs> common and their knowledge and understanding and commitment um, to the east, eastern end of the county, but so many of the decisions that we look at are on the western end of the county. And there are a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences, and having that breadth of knowledge uh, is so important. The other thing I shared uh, with the other two candidates when I talked to them yesterday is um, Bridget has been in an elected office several, <laughs> several times and served on a planning commission previously. And with the amount of effort and work that are going on today in this county, I think her um, background and expertise is so important to good good decision making and good collaboration on the commission. I think we really um, need our constituents to see that the commissioners are hearing their concerns and addressing those. And uh, I think all three could have done that, but Bridget does have that extra level of experience in public service for this county and our, our fellow cities. So with that, um, I, I could go on about all of her qualifications, but I think all three candidates are incredibly, we're honored that you all were willing to serve at the big salary we give our planning commissioners for the headaches that they have to uh, confront uh, dealing with uh, some of the contentious issues that have come back to us. So with that, I would make a motion to nominate Bridget Powers to take this position. Thank you, Jim. So we have a motion second. Are there any comments here or any comments from the public? I if I may, I would like to just make a comment. First of all, I want to say thank you. Um, it, what I really appreciated is that we had three people who applied for this commission <coughs> seat um, who have a long time history. Their families have history, um, especially in uh, the eastern part of the county. And that's terrific because as we have a lot of projects taking place in the basin, uh, whether it's transportation, land use, trying to find affordable housing, uh, we need your help on a number of different fronts, right? Whether it's the planning commission, but there's so many different committees and we really need people 
who are invested in the community, who are willing to volunteer and spend um, spend the time serving our community in some of these key roles. So um, I just appreciate um, the willingness of you, Scott, and, and Jim, who's not here. Um, I think it's terrific. Um, and as you you know get involved more, encourage other people to come join you, uh, because we need the input from our community as we move forward. Are there any members of the public who would like? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> as a uh, Planning Col Commission alumni, um, I would echo what you said, Cindy, and I think I know Bridget well, uh, uh, perfectly comfortable with her, <clears throat> excuse me, taking on this responsibility. I don't know Scott all that well, but I would only add that we should find something for him as quickly I as possible. I have a list of jobs <laughs> that he and I started discussing them yesterday. Before he comes to his senses. <laughs> 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 and we lose him as a resource. <laughs> and I told him a little less pay, but a lot less headache. Uh, we're involved in a lot of the other committees, and he is very interested in getting involved. So, any public comments on this item? Okay, great. Then uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you both. Thank you. Congratulations, Bridget. Or I, we, it's sympathy to you. Congratulations, <laughs> to you, <Chris>. Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so with that, we'll move on. Uh, we are at 1:30, and we can move to our Community Development Resource Agency Placer County Emergency Shelter Conditional Use Permit Modification. And Callie, you're handling this for us. It's on 5:39 of your board packet. This is on. Can you, oh, there we go. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Callie Kedinger Cecil, Senior Planner with the Planning Services Division. The item before you this morning is a request from the County Executive Office to extend the uh, use permit for the emergency shelter for an additional five years. I don't have the normal clicker here. Oh, there it is. I don't know if this is a, I don't know if that's ours or what, but. Um, so the uh, homeless shelter is located within the Placer County Government Center between E and F Avenues, north of Atwood Road. It's shown here, highlighted in red. The site is zoned heavy commercial with a combining design corridor and a combining aircraft overflight zone district. The uh, shelter building is approximately 16,137 square feet and has an outdoor courtyard area consisting of approximately 8,200 square feet. The shelter includes a dining area and classrooms, outdoor courtyards, um, sleeping areas, separate showers for men and women, lockers, administrative areas, uh, and an outdoor mobile kitchen on the south side of the building. The outdoor courtyards are secured behind fences and gates that can be controlled by staff and security cameras also monitor the project site. Surrounding uses include professional offices, medical and industrial uses, and storage facilities. Residential and school facilities are approximately 500 to 1,000 feet from the project site, and the Health and Human Services Adult System of, of Care is about 1,000 feet from the project site. And that, uh, that uh, system provides services for mental health, substance abuse, and other medical and counseling services for the homeless population. And a public bus stop is approximately 700 feet from the shelter. So the shelter provides services to homeless adults who are residents of Placer County with priority given to individuals who are from the Auburn area. The shelter is open 24 hours per day, seven days per week, and has a capacity for up to 100 men or women, not including shelter staff. The shelter provides a place to sleep, meals, restrooms, showers, and laundry services, in addition to support services with the ultimate goal of transitioning people to permanent housing facilities. These residents are assigned a case manager and receive referrals or are enrolled in mental health, substance abuse treatment, medical care, legal assistance, and job training programs. The permit term of the shelter is five years. The applicant is the county executive office and they are requesting approval to extend the use of the shelter for five years. The existing use permit was approved on May 9th, 2017 and expires on May 9th, 2022. If approved, the shelter would continue operations until 2027. I would also like to note that there are no changes to the shelter operations proposed, nor are there any physical changes to the shelter building. 
For some additional project history, in February of 2015, the Board of Supervisors approved a temporary conditional use permit to allow for the establishment of a temporary emergency shelter. That CUP, conditional use permit, was extended for one year through an extension of time until 2016. In January 10th, 2017, the board adopted an ordinance to amend the county code to allow emergency shelters within the industrial, industrial park, and heavy commercial zone districts with approval of a conditional use permit. On May 9th, 2017, your board approved a five-year conditional use permit for an emergency shelter on the county government center in order to provide services to homeless individuals. The, uh, Placer County general plan housing element was updated last year and includes uh, policies for providing homeless shelter and support services. Those policies are noted above. And this is to demonstrate that the proposed shelter is compatible with the zoning um, as well as the, um, as the general plan housing element update. And it includes policies for assisting and supporting nonprofit organizations that provide shelter and services to homeless persons and the goal of continuing to support shelter programs, including consideration of funding programs developed through interjurisdictional cooperation. Those are the kinds of policies that were adopted with the housing element update. Emergency shelters are allowed in the heavy commercial zone district with approval of a conditional use permit. And the use is compatible with existing um, uses and support services have been provided at the government center for at least 20 years. A neighborhood relations plan, security plan, homeless uh, community liaison plan, and feedback protocols have been established for the shelter to minimize impacts to surrounding areas. So the neighborhood relations plan includes establishment of a feedback and complaint system. Complaints are logged and provided to Health and Human Services staff as requested. The operator and HHS staff also attend uh, MAC forums as, as needed or requested. There are entry and exit procedures that are designed to minimize impact to surrounding land uses. And finally, staff is trained for standard protocols. As part of the neighborhood relations plan, there are uh, feedback protocols and the um, Health and Human Services uh, webpage has that um, publicly available. You can find that by searching Placer County Homeless Shelter in the web browser. But that includes uh, feedback mechanisms to uh, the shelter as well as to HHS staff. A security plan has also been established for the shelter that includes providing lighting and cameras at all of the entry and exit points, establishing intake procedures to control uh, check-in process. Residents are uh, not allowed to bring in alcohol, drugs, or weapons and must be, uh, they must abide by a rule of conduct. And there is a homeless community liaison program that involves the regular patrol of the site and they document, track, and link individuals to services. This project was uh, presented to the North Auburn MAC on January 11th, and at that meeting, the MAC discussed how the shelter had been a, a success, provides uh, necessary services, and that it should continue. The MAC voted uh, unanimously to recommend approval to the Planning Commission, and on February 10th, uh, staff took this item to the Planning Commission, and at that hearing, we heard three public comments, and uh, the Gathering In shelter operator was also there. There was a discussion surrounding countywide homeless issues and success of the shelter. There was a long discussion about um, the perception of the existing homeless camp perhaps being exacerbated by the shelter. And there was a long discussion how the shelter had been in existence long before that occurred. Uh, and ultimately, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to recommend that your board approve the conditional use permit. So staff is requesting that the board take the following actions, that you find the proposed conditional use permit modification is categorically exempt from, cal from review under the California Environmental Quality Act, and to approve the conditional use permit modification for a maximum of five years, subject to the conditions uh, of approval contained in the staff report. With that, I conclude my presentation. We also have Amy Ellis here from HHS, as well as Keith Diedrich from The Gathering In, should you have any questions, and I'm also available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Board members, do you have any questions? Yes, Bonnie. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Just a couple of things. First of all, I appreciate the report and the update. Um, so for this item, everything remains as it is currently, right? The operations of the shelter, no change in footprint, et cetera. 
if you know currently we have this um, task force to look at strategies to address um, homelessness for the county um, if there were recommendations um, that came back to make changes to this site whether it was services or increase the bed capacity or whatever those changes might be what would that process be I mean they'd have to go through a hearing so can you just share mm -hmm. what that would be yeah so that th that would be the process we're going through now which is the conditional use permit modification the conditions of approval limit the number of people they they establish the operational features of the shelter so if any of that were to be modified they would have to go through the same process which includes submitting an application that application is reviewed by staff we present that application to the municipal advisory committee and then we go to the planning commission and your board so there are multiple opportunities for for review and input <coughs> In, in such a situation. Perfect. And I think I just wanted to make sure folks were aware that if any changes were made, we would have another public hearing to talk about making any changes. Um, and my next question is, uh, who with Health and Human Services, right, because there's a contract with Health and Human Services to make sure that this contract is taken care of um, and that the contractor fulfills their obligations, mm -hmm. right? So who makes sure that that happens? How, what's that process? That's the adult system of care, Amy Ellis. And Amy, I don't know if you'd like to I mean, speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, um, we hold that contract. In fact, it's up next for, for this board to discuss. Um, actually, I have the program manager who is the contract monitor, Aaron Cador. He's brand new to Placer County here today. And we um, work closely with the contractor. We have frequent meetings. Um, we both meet with them about the contract. And then there's even a more, a larger group that inf inc involves our HLT members, um, facility staff, Rob attends, others attend to really strategize any challenges that arise and how we can work together to resolve them. Any other questions? Yes, Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I have just a comment. I have, you know, living out there, uh, I, I really know that the, the shelter is well managed uh, and there's very few complaints that, to, that my office gets. Uh, so. Uh, I have no problem moving forward with this. Although I would ask the lieutenant if she could come forward and uh, explain what uh, your relationship with the shelter has been. Sure, uh, Lieutenant Connie Schmidt, um, been here before. Um, we work real close. You know, our HLT, HLD team, our deputies that are on the ground, they're immense in, in what's going on out there. Uh -huh. And they have really good relationships with the people at the shelter. So. We work closely with them. We get our um, the the people that are out at the camps, um, the people that want that service. Uh -huh. They work well with getting them into the shelter as well. So we have a great working relationship. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Okay. Any public comment on this item? I am Cale Muscott. I'm the district administrator for the Auburn Recreation District. And I get to do like a two for one. It was really cool to see you guys appoint Bridget. I've known Bridget forever. She's the real deal. And I think you guys all know that. But so is Keith and what they do for uh, the community with the shelter. And just so you guys know, if you, if you weren't aware, they come out once a week. They bring out their guests. I, I believe they refer to, we refer to them as guests. They bring them out to the park. And they help us out with park maintenance, pulling weeds, raking paint or cleaning garbage cans whatever we need them to do they're out there helping us out and they just come out because they want to uh, contribute back to the community so um, they've been great partners Keith's always there if we've got questions or concerns and um, I fully endorse them going forward with another five years at least thank you Kale. any other public comments Gary Mappa Applegate as one of the founders of the shelter seven years ago. I'm totally pleased with what we have here today, and I completely endorse keeping the gathering in as the operating agency. I think it's a fine, stellar thing that we've accomplished. Thank you. Oh, and lastly, I'm pleased that you selected Bridget. She's a longtime friend, and she's very committed to the community, and she has connections that will be 
definitely an asset. Was anyone else paid to give Bridget a compliment here? <laughs> Are there any other public comments on this item? Okay. Kathleen, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Okay, my mic's unmuted. Yes. Um, this is in regards to the temporary emergency homeless shelter. I don't know how many of you remember the words temporary emergency homeless shelter at no cost to you, but I do. It's been years ago. And if you look around Auburn, you'll see the results of this thrown together money pit and the mess it has created. I have read the plans for the center in South Placer and it sounds wonderful and well thought out. Please deny the request for the five year extension for the current temporary emergency homeless shelter. I understand the panic if we stop providing the paid for easy living the homeless has become accustomed to, but offer instead a two year extension and have the South Plaster site ready to, tra to, transmit, to transmit into. Please don't kick the can down the road. Enough money has been thrown at the Auburn site. It's not working. Give the South Plaster site get it up and functioning. And I'd also like to throw in that one of the founding things, what we, why it had to be in Auburn was because all of the resources are right here for them and they could walk and get all the resources. And as I spoke earlier, that is what you just approved for a building so they can have access to the library, to the internet, to the, uh, going to, to mail something. So anyway, to me, you've pretty much double dipped for this. Um, I think the South Class would be much better than continuing something that was patched together. But you'll do what you want. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I see no further public comment. Okay. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, come on up. We didn't mean to skip you. <laughs> I just found out about this meeting two days ago, and I'm I'm Ill. sorry, can I just interrupt? Can you give us your name? Yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Diana Granier Latham. I am, unfortunately, at this time, a resident of that shelter. And I didn't know this meeting was, no one told us. Um, someone saw the sign somewhere by happenstance, but the people that operate the shelter told us nothing about this and it's sad because I think you would have found a lot of comment rebuting some of the things they say they're doing and um, believe me I'm a viable person I had a career and I went through some unfortunate things but I am not finding the gathering ends operating of the shelter to be up to the standards that they say, even say that they're doing. Um, I went to Oregon for three years to be with my aunt and Volunteers of America operated that shelter. It was not a flop house. It was someone where they helped you to get on your feet, get going, they treated you with dignity and respect. I don't find that happening with the gathering in. They say they have signed you a case manager that's not what's happening. And, and I wish I had more time, and I wish some other people had known. I could have garnered people to have documentation for what I'm talking about. Believe me, this is spur of the moment, and I'm probably not doing very well. And I'm not, a, I'm not a negative person. I would like it to see it, it being better operated. They say they go out and do the parks every week. Well, that's a punishment now for some people that don't do something. That hasn't been going on. Um, everything there is punitive and, and without dignity. I think they didn't handle the COVID situation well. And like I said, I don't, did not have time to put facts together and write even anything down. This is 
totally off the cuff. And I don't know if you would give us more, me more time, I could go and, you know, put something together better. But I just want to make my comment that I think that, that, that doc, what they're telling you is occurring there is not what's occurring there. And um, they, they, for one example, and this is just a my, at Christmas they put this whole list together of all these things they were doing. They did none of them. But I'm quite sure they presented to you folks that they did all these things. And I think that there's quite a bit of that going on. Now, it would take me time to get it all proven together. I, I just wanted to comment, and I'm the only person there that knows about this meeting. Why didn't they let us know so that we could come and comment on, am I done? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, wrap up. I, I, I hope maybe you could um, um, postpone this, you know, put it out a little, you know, month or so. And, and see if we can get something together. I'd like to see them succeed and do what they're saying, but that's just not what I see happening there. Thank you. Uh -huh, thank you. And I believe a lot of your comments are directed at the next item, but um, we'll go ahead and continue to take public comments on this item, which is the use of the building as an emergency shelter. My name is Peter Conrad. I'm, I'm going to represent several hats. I wear a hat as a downtown building owner and business owner, and I cl clean up my parking lot on weekends from the, the broken sprinkler pipes and the trash and all the aftermath um, that happens with the homeless in the community. I also founded my own nonprofit, and on the flip side, I serve dinner four days a month to 140 people between the, the 100 people, the staff, the the um, shut-ins and so I I come with a balanced view of we're not going to fix homelessness we need to manage it the best we can and and this is the best thing that we have so far I I see a lot of things I I look at people and think you need to give back and I see the county giving huge resources. I sat in on the meeting for the camping ordinances. I can't believe the resources the county puts in, the state, the gathering in, the local business owners. Um, and I'm glad to see programs like Kale's where they get an opportunity to give back a little bit because that is what creates some dignity in life. And it is a transitional place. I have been doing this with Volunteers of America, and I got to know every single person because when I serve dinner, I sit down and I want to meet three new people after I serve. And they're all so grateful when we're serving dinner, but I got to know every single person there because they were all there consistently for years. And I finally am meeting new faces now as they revolve through there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Are there any other public comments on this item? Not seeing any, so we'll close um, the public hearing on this um, and consider the recommendation from the Placer County Planning Commission for approval of the following the conditional use permit modification. Well, I don't need to reread it because it's all up on the board for me. Thank you, Kelly. Um, do I have a motion to approve that? Supervisor Holmes made the motion. Supervisor Wygant second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. And we're a few minutes before two for the next item. So we'll take a quick break, I guess. We're going to reconvene now that it's 2 o'clock. Apologize for that delay, but we'll call the meeting back to order and we'll resume with our 2 o'clock timed item. This is item 10A. Um, we are continuing uh, 10A2, the second part of this, uh, to a future meeting. And I wanted to announce that right up front, but 10A1 we are going to be discussing now. 
Is that correct? Do I have that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That right. Okay. Thanks, Amy. And members of the board, today I have one. I had two there, but one action item for you to consider. First, uh, to approve an agreement with the Gathering Inn to continue operation of the Auburn Shelter at Placer County Government Center in an amount not to exceed $1,887,074 for the period of May 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subs subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence so um the difference on this is the last item was about just the use of the site and this is now the operations of of the um, actual facility so on may 9th in 2017 this board approved the first site access agreement which for the 100 bed Sh Auburn shelter and today just approved the new conditional use permit for five additional years. On June 5th, 2018, as a result of, the re of a request for proposal, a service contract was entered with the gathering in and renewed in June of 2020. Today, we come to this board again to continue this service contract. For nearly four years, the Gathering Inn has operated the 100-bed Auburn Emergency Shelter on the Placer County Government uh, Center campus. The um, Emergency Shelter operates 24 hours per day, seven days per week. The Emergency Shelter provides basic services such as food, shelter, and bathroom and shower access, as well as advanced services such as individualized assessment, tailored case management, and linkage to supportive services that promote housing stability and independence. The emergency shelter readily accommodates uh, verified service animals that belong to guests. Uh, TGI adheres to standards that help ensure that both guests and staff remain safe, including rules of conduct and appropriate staffing levels, video cameras, controlled check-ins, and much more that's outlined in their contract. They also utilize residency requirements to ensure that their services reach residents of Placer County. Assigned homeless community liaison deputies regularly patrol the campus and North Auburn community and can quickly respond to calls for services and have regular meetings with TGI staff to address concerns that arise. Residents and others in the community can also submit complaints for our staff to review and to address as needed. This shelter contract has no significant changes to operations, number served, or service model from the prior approved contract. Since July 1st, 2021, uh, 35 guests or 24% exited to permanent housing, six guests went into transitional housing, and over half left with some form of regular income, which provides more options to seek housing options, and 87% exited with health insurance. County general fund contribution of $1,887,074 for general operating support to ongoing service provision has been included in the department's fiscal year 2021-22 budget and the department's fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, I have staff available to answer, and myself to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Amy, appreciate that. Um, are there any board questions? Amy, while you're up here, you might address um, the member of the public that spoke on the last item uh, and to her concerns uh, that she expressed on yeah. how we oversee that contract with the gathering in. Yeah, so um, immediately the contract manager did um, outreach to the individual to get more about that experience. Um, I had again, that's why I would encourage individuals, any other individual, they could submit uh, their experiences or complaints to us there, that is um, on the website, there is a link for that, but we can, we are happy to follow up with individuals or go over to the shelter and maybe like put it on the wall of like, if you have complaints here, you can ask, we're happy to do that. Um, and then what we do is we spot check those and see if, you know, see if there's validity and then address those with the contractor as necessary. Sometimes they can be resolved and sometimes they can't, but we do go through that process to try to resolve what we can. Well, I think it would be great just as one supervisor for you to have staff go visit. Um, I know in the opportunity I had with Supervisor Holmes to go and prepare a meal, uh, we got to talk to a number of the residents. And I, I just, I think, uh, 
trying to understand government and where to lodge issues and concerns, uh, we could certainly help these folks get, uh, get a better understanding of what to expect. Um, and yeah, we're happy to make that easier to access to residents as needed because it is a regular part of our oversight of contracts to not just work with the staff, but to check in with residents about their experience. Great, and I appreciate getting the statistics too. I wanted to make mention of that because I, I do get asked about the public. How successful is this program? You know, of course, we'd love to see that it's 100%, but just to see that 87% are exiting, they have now health insurance and some form of income, and hopefully we'll get their lives back on track um, through that. Great, if there's no other comments or questions. Oh, Suzanne, thank you. I was just going to say, uh, to continue that thought, um, I'm not sure how many of your folks that reside there have access to computers. Maybe you should provide comment cards or something like that. I mean, you'll probably get a lot of crackpot things, but you know, you don't have to read through them all anyway. Well, we would, we definitely would. I think it's a good suggestion and we're gonna look into that and follow up on that right away. Great, thank you, okay. No other comments or questions here. Uh, I see Keith is here, and are there any other members of the public who would like to address this item? Uh, Keith Dieterich, President and CEO of The Gathering Inn. Um, one of the things that we do upon intake, everybody that comes into the shelter, they're made aware of our grievance policy, and we really do encourage people if they have concerns. I love it when it's written down. Because if it's written down, then I really understand what the issue is and we can address it. Uh, so every person that comes into the gathering in is made aware of that. I have my shelter director here, Clyde, and uh, I uh, spoke to him about that particular individual and you can be assured that we're going to follow up with that. Thank you. And any other comments you'd like to make while you're up? No, we really uh, appreciate our partnership with the uh, uh, county and HHS and uh, look forward to uh, continuing our services. And we really do look at anything that we can do to get better. Um, we are a learning organization. We're certainly not perfect, uh, but uh, we have a heart uh, for the people that we're serving. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to work with the county. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Really appreciate the good work you do for us and helping all of our unhoused. Are there other individuals who'd like to speak to this item? Anybody online? I'd entertain a motion then to approve the agreement with the gathering in. Holmes and Gore on the motion. Uh, Cindy, can I yes. comment? Yeah, I'm going to support the motion easily. I just wanted to make a couple of statements. Um, I think Jim and I lived through the whole history of this facility opening up, which was a learning experience. Um, and to me, I think it's a rich template for the kind of opportunity that exists in Placer County. If there's any place in the country where we can actually uh, set an example of where dealing with our homeless population in a constructive situation uh, exist. It, it's here with our Placer Model of Health and Human Services, the collaboration that they have with our public protection partners. Um, uh, if I know uh, there's the committee in place that is working through that process and it's not quite ready yet, uh, but if we get to the point where the city partners actually in concert with the county uh, really willing to, are willing to step up to the plate and, and make a grand statement, I can't think of a better place where that would be successful we we made some mistakes along the way uh, we added some elements uh, to all this we required our wraparound services we worked more closely with our policing with community policing uh, those are the kinds of things that we can build on it's going to cost some money to do it it's going to save money in the long run there's no more expensive housing than there is in our jail or in our emergency uh, uh, hospitalizations so uh, with that, I, I just wanted to make those comments and mention my support for the motion. Great, thank you. I'm sorry if I skipped over any other comments. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, thank you all very much. And we're now three or four minutes early for our final item.
<laughs> which is going to, yeah. It's going to be continued. I know. We, we do need to wait to the appointed time. To I think we need longer agendas. We always do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we'll take a three-minute break and uh, be right back. So this is now our 215 timed item, item number 11. And I'm not sure who's going to make this announcement. EJ. We are. Good afternoon. EJ Avaldi, your planning director. Uh, so the next item, the Ridge, we're asking for a continuance uh, to a time certain on May 10th. Uh, the clerk of the board and I were just discussing times. <laughs> uh, 11 o'clock. We have a time slot at 11 o'clock. Okay, great. So we'll continue item, and so we'll need a motion to continue item 11A to May 10th at 11 a.m. unless there's public comment. There is none. Okay, motion Wygant, second Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And I'm just hoping you're so we were good at 2, I'm assuming 11 o'clock the same day would be good. Uh, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll work that out, so we'll make it work. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I believe that concludes all of our business for today, so we'll stand adjourned.